Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Budget Committee meeting for uh, March 8th, uh, Wednesday. It is 9.32 a.m. and I'm just calling this meeting that started on March 1st back to order. Uh, so where we are on the agenda, the agenda was posted uh, for the March 1st meeting. Where we are on the agenda is we are going to be hearing from Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency about their operating budget. And so, uh, Chief Steubing, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through Council. Pleasure to be here today to present our annual business plans. Want to, first of all, send a shout out to all the women colleagues I work with, uh, the members of councils and, and my bosses uh, on International Women's Day. So uh, we continue to be an uh, organization that uh, appreciates diversity and I uh, thought I'd start by that. Uh, thank you, it is a pleasure to be here. Ken Steubing, the Executive Director and Fire Chief for Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency. Uh, you have in front of you uh, a copy of our business plans. I've hope, I hope you've had a chance to take a look at that. Uh, there's a lot more detail in the business plans than I'll have time to cover here today. Uh, we will be going through our business plans at a 50,000 foot view and talk to you about um, some community risk factors that we've become aware of that we plan to address this year in our business plans. I would like to first acknowledge I'm here with some of our great management team, uh, including our business and policy analyst and coordinator beside me, uh, Jennifer Mark, and we have members of our team sitting back at headquarters ready to be able to answer any questions you might have. So uh, I am going to start into our presentation and Obviously, I think Council is probably very familiar with our mission to save lives, property, and the environment. As I've shared with you in the past, we continue to uh, pivot our organization to be a proactive organization and reduce community risk by uh, many different means. First and foremost, with public safety education, fire code enforcement, uh, and fire inspections, mitigation, and emergency preparedness, um, and then we are also mobilizing our frontline troops to assist with that where the vast majority of our horsepower is. Obviously, we have emergency response and recovery efforts as we try to achieve our mission. We have, I'm a, I'm a big fan of form follows function. So when I came here, I thought there was an opportunity to follow that community risk reduction uh, strategy, which is an industry best practice. And I was happy to see this organization was already uh, started down that path. We have structured our organization to support that function and also to be a performance excellence organization. So we are structured with three pillars. The first pillar is community risk reduction, as you see, logistics, professional development, uh, and that professional development also includes our medical training and continuous quality improvement programs. So the whole objective of that team is to prevent the emergency from happening in the first place, if at all possible, and give our people the training and the equipment they need to be able to do their job uh, effectively. Then obviously we have our operations pillar, which is where the vast majority of our horsepower is. Um, that is our, you know, firefighters uh, and um, folks that work in our 51 stations thread th uh, spread throughout HRM and they are involved in those community risk reduction initiatives that I talked about and then we also have our performance and safety pillar which is the checkers and doers that is where we continue to improve our performance by analyzing our data making sure our people are safe using technology and innovation to work smarter rather than harder and try to be an organization of change. It is also where we focus on our people, including our workplace culture commitments. Uh, I think you've seen this slide before. You can see we've made some strides in um, uh, 
addressing some of our vacancies. So we are currently training 25 firefighters at our training academy as I speak, including a, a bunch of volunteer firefighters who are training on the weekends. So our training division has been, quite frankly, running wide open since COVID, trying to fill the vacancies. So we still have 11 vacancies in our uh, career ranks. Um, we continue to chip away at that deficit in our volunteer ranks, as you can see. We also have staff in uh, our training and prevention and logistics uh, teams and our administrative support and, uh, and our emergency management. I also added to the 51 stations that we have eight other facilities that we maintain as part of our footprint which is largely what some of that West Bedford station is about. It's about reducing that capital footprint to save money in maintaining those buildings, to be more efficient as an organization. For example, logistics works out of two facilities, training works out of two facilities, fire prevention works out of two facilities. So we are not able to you know, engage with our people as much as we would like. We are shuffling people and resources between those places and not very efficient in how we operate. Uh, that uh, capital project, when it comes to fruition, will save us uh, almost half a million dollars every three years on lease uh, arrangements. Uh, you can see that we have, uh, out of our 51 stations, 22 that are volunteer only, quite frankly, a couple couple of those stations, three I think it is, have no volunteers in them. So we continue to maintain the asset in hopes that our recruitment efforts will be able to stand up that station. We do have some good news on that front that I'll share with you a little bit later. We have nine 24-hour stations and we have uh, a total of 20 stations that we consider composite uh, stations which have career and volunteers, either 24-hour stations or 10 and a half hour day sh stations that we call our e-platoon. Just want to acknowledge some of the successes of the team. First of all, happy to say we have finally uh, finished our FUS evaluation. FUS stands for Fire Underwriter Survey. Uh, you might have recalled us talking about it in the past. It was actually due when I came here five years ago. It's an assessment that happens by this independent organization every five years to assess fire service delivery, which ultimately uh, affects insurance rates. I have a slide coming up on that later, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. We were able to pilot a quick response strategy in Peggy's Cove to address some risk with, uh, with water emergencies out there, look to build on that this year. I've already talked about the recruitment efforts in both the and training efforts by our training committee, sorry, academy for both career and volunteer firefighters. And uh, I would just like to acknowledge that we have actually increased our volunteer recruitment by 25% over last year in uh, our fire district 5 East, which is the Eastern Shore. Uh, however, we still have gaps that I'll talk to you about later. Uh, both our career and volunteer recruitment efforts have uh, demonstrated a very good success in creating diverse teams. So we're certainly proud of that effort. And I thought I would share a little bit of information about a program not many of you probably know about. It's something that we do behind the scenes. Uh, we don't try to have a lot of fanfare about it, but it certainly is something we're proud about. And that's a partnership we have with the federal government to work with youth that are at risk. And we call it our Emergency Service Achievement Program. So it's fully funded by the feds. It's a program that we run um, to provide hard and soft skill uh, training for youth at risk to help them get work experience and in a lot of cases maintain that work experience with the work placement they're giving, given. So it's kind of like an internship program where we use our brand to build relationship with uh, employers to give work experience. And as you can see by this bullet, 40% uh, of the last class actually stayed on with those employers after that work experience. And we've been funded for another eight students again this year. Uh, we also were able to implement the two additional firefighters council gave us last year for Black Point. So that station now runs with four, which is, uh, which is our best practice. 
and certainly the industry best practice. We have implemented the two additional firefighters 24 hours a day in Bedford Sackville. It has uh, made a difference, but uh, I have some news to share on that a little bit later. We piloted uh, high-speed internet in our rural stations. Uh, that's been very successful and able, uh, enabled us to be able to train our volunteer firefighters in some of those remote communities at distance a lot more effectively, helping our recruitment and retention efforts. And we're looking to possibly be able to make some of that high-speed internet kind of like the library strategy for uh, the community centers that we're attached to. So stay, stay tuned to that, more work to do on that. We continue to have one of the highest customer satisfaction rates in HRM, despite the fact when people see us, they're not usually having a very good day. We're continuing to be proud on our people to do that great work and are focusing leadership development and fire prevention officers and inspectors uh, in order to be able to manage our customer relations even better. So we continue to want to improve that performance metric uh, happy to say we have a four-year collective agreement that was ratified by council and uh, our colleagues behind us. Just want to thank our union president and one of his uh, executive for attending today. Thank you very much, President Meager. And uh, I just want to say, you know, that certainly gives us an opportunity to continue to focus on the future without having to bargain uh, what we should be doing in the present and in the past. Um, and we were successful in rolling out the first step of our wildland urban interface strategy. We are becoming a fire smart um, organization, which is actually a federal uh, wildfire initiative. Uh, it is a responsibility of the provincial government to manage wildfires and wildland areas, but it, it is no secret that we are typically there first. So this is a strategy where we can train our people not only the strategies and tactics and how to use the equipment to safely and effectively fight those fires, but also uh, the Fire Smart program is around mitigation and prevention. And we'll be continuing that effort this year. Just a shout out to the team for their efforts during Fiona. As you can see, our ops folks were very busy with 633 incidents respo responded to in HRM, uh, actually even outside HRM during uh, the three days of Fiona. Obviously, our EOC was activated. Send a shout out to our GEMS teams for the work that they did in setting up the four evacuation centers and eight community comfort centers. Our GSAR colleagues who I see are here today uh, continued to do community wellness checks, uh, not only during the hurricane, but they obviously do that throughout the year, particularly during adverse weather effects. So it takes uh, a large team and coordinated effort to keep HRM residents safe during events like that. I also want to, you know, send a shout out to our GSAR team, or I mean our HUSAR team, because for the first time since standing up our heavy urban search and rescue team, our team was activated uh, first to go up and help Cape Breton maintain critical infrastructure by sending generators and fueling capabilities up there. And as we were on our way back from there, we got deployed by the federal government to PICTO to help with the power situation that they had there. And you can see we had over 60 personnel that were on site. Uh, we set up the base camp, as you can see by the picture on the right. We were tasked uh, under the ICS system to work underneath uh, Department of Natural Resources. And we were tasked to work with Nova Scotia Power to get access to power lines with our uh, chainsaw teams and had 60 people on scene 24 hours a day for about two and a half weeks and set up that base camp that you see in front of you. So certainly proud that we're able to finally start to deploy that team. And because it was federally uh, activated, it means the cost should be recovered. Uh, plans for next year. Uh, busy, busy year for us. Uh, we are quite happy to say we have finally secured a vendor for our station alerting software, which means we will be able to activate our stations from the dispatch center to go out to the call much quicker. 
we are looking to harness anywhere from 30 to 40 seconds of savings in response time. And when you only have 90 to start with, that's a huge improvement. So we are excited about that, continuing our work with HUSAR. Uh, we are restarting the roster project, which is a scheduling project that we had started in the past. Uh, that, that project was derailed a little bit because of some challenges with the vendor. And this is really uh, the strategy to fill vacancies when vacancies happen, whether that's because of vacation or somebody gets sick at two o'clock in the morning or get injured at work at two o'clock in the morning and you need to find a backfill for that. This is technology that will fill those positions much quicker than the, the process that we have now, which is based on people making calls. And we will continue our efforts as the capital budget allows to increase our generator capacity at comfort centers. So we continue to try to uh, work as part of the Halifax strategy to reduce our carbon footprint and be an organization and community that is resilient during uh, these times of climate change. You will see that uh, down at the bottom, the bottom bullet, we are uh, doing our high risk vulnerability assessment. So that is probably gonna take about a year to two years to complete that uh, vulnerability assessment. And that information includes the critical infrastructure assessment and what risk factors exist in the municipality and will be fed into the update of our emergency plan, which is up for renewal. You can see we have uh, a bunch of other strategies that we'll be working on there, one of which I've already talked about, expanding our wildland urban interface strategy and our critical infrastructure uh, assessment as part of that update to the emergency plan and improve our emergency communications. I have a little bit of uh, information coming up, so I'm not gonna spend uh, a lot of detail on this slide, but we continue to work on the AG recommendations. Some of those are technology, some of those are people, some of those are performance measurements. And we have uh, work going on with our IT folks and an uh, external vendor to use uh, technological solutions to improve our performance and accountability with that work as you can see in the first bullet, and we are continuing to update our policies and improve our ability to do performance management and uh, be, use data to inform uh, risk-based uh, inspections. So the next uh, project that I'd like to talk to you about is our fire service accreditation. We've talked to you about this in the past. We continue down the path towards fire service accreditation with CFAI, which is what you see up in the top right hand corner. We are on track to do our site review in three years. So we have another two years to complete uh, our strategic plan and our standards of cover, which is validating everything that we're supposed to be doing. We continue to work with EHS to align our service delivery with the pressures that they are facing that consequently, consequently we are facing. So I'll go over that you'll see what I'm talking about in a future slide. So we continue to work uh, collaboratively with those partners. And I've also showed you a picture of the dashboard that we developed with performance excellence. So we are required to track our emergency response time target. And this is an example of one of the dashboards that we have available. And this one just happens to be on our uh, response time performance. And you can see all the different tabs that we can click on to drill down to see where our performance is uh, needing some improvement. And we continue to use technology and innovation wherever possible to work smarter rather than harder. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I will say that this continues to be a passion and a priority for our organization. We have a goal to be a diverse community that's representative of the communities we serve. And that includes building relationships with those communities. A, so that we better understand them and they better understand and trust our brand, uh, but also that people who might not have thought about fire service as a career option might very well consider that. So we can continue to build those relationships. We're uh, working to uh, achieve our goals, to follow our five-year action plan. We continue to monitor our progress on that. We work with our DNI. 
um, teammates to be able to deliver quality education and help our people understand what it is like to be from a different community and be part of uh, the community that we serve. Uh, and our goal will be to align all of those priorities in our strategic plan this year. Uh, coming back to our progress on the AG's uh, report on fire prevention, um, some good news and bad news. The good news is we continue to improve our performance with inspections, as you can see, year over year. As we do more inspections, we find more problems, which typically requires further inspections. So our goal will be to be in every building and have addressed the major issues. Uh, it doesn't mean next time you inspect on the next annual cycle, three or five years later, that you won't find more problems, but hopefully there'll be less. So it takes many inspections to get a completed case that you see on this graph, but both inspections that are in flight and completed cases increase. The bad news is uh, so does the increasing number of buildings that we're required to inspect. So you can see we're still trying to narrow in on our target. Uh, this is something that I have presented to council in the past. The, the first item is really you know, the cost effectiveness of our service delivery model. MBN, uh, we are no longer part of MBN, but we continue to track our progress towards those uh, data sets because it's one of the few ways we can compare ourselves to others. NBN, I will acknowledge MBN dropped the first metric. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know what the medium is, median is now, but you can see what has happened to our numbers over that five year period. When we did participate in NBN, there were not many fire services like us. Most of them are larger fire departments, and I do represent the Canadian Metro Chiefs on the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs Advisory Committee, uh, as well as the big city fire chiefs that I've talked to the mayor about. And the only two other departments that are metro departments that have a similar structure uh, and uh, operational model, which would be composite, would be Hamilton and Ottawa. Ottawa does not participate in this exercise, so we can't compare the numbers, but when you take a look at the cost of our service delivery model compared to the median, the only one that is close to us is Hamilton. And Hamilton is a service that relies on career and volunteers to work together, which is partly why our numbers are so different. So when you go on to the next bullet, or the next, uh, uh, key performance indicators, you can see the number of staffed fire service hours per capita. So you can see that, you know, our numbers have uh, started to dwindle, uh, they started to drop, which really means to me, we are not keeping up with the per capita growth in the community, that we are not investing necessarily as much in the fire service as the capita growth uh, would dictate we should if we stayed status quo. However, uh, you should be able to validate that through other metrics, and I'll get to that in a little bit. This is a, a key performance indicator that MBN continues to report, and one that fire services uh, certainly hold near and dear because part of their mission is to save lives. This is a metric that we have struggled with in the past because sometimes we don't necessarily know if somebody leaves the scene alive and then dies later in the hospital that we've captured that. We've since reached out to the coroner's office and the coroner's office has agreed this is an important, important metric and they will help us capture people that have left the scene alive and possibly died after they were in the hospital. So while we expect this data metric to be more accurate in the future, the bad news is that will probably increase the metric, if anything, meaning our performance will get worse. Um, uh, just a quick presentation on our uh, pressures with calls. Our calls over last year have gone up 34%, and in every single category we've seen an increase. Uh, in all the categories you see listed, but it is pretty obvious to see where the vast majority of those calls are coming from. Even if you take out the drop we had for our medical calls during COVID, 
uh, and go back to pre-COVID dates, the, that spike and in increase is significant, which is why we're working with EHS as I identified earlier. Uh, they have acknowledged that they need to probably work differently with us because we are 60% of the call volume of the whole province. And we have stations located throughout HRM that are strategic in location and our training for medical response is the same for our career and volunteer firefighters. So what we do with one, we can do with the other, which is not the way it is in the fire service across the province. So we are excited about continuing those discussions with EHS, but it's a little premature to say what might come out of them at this point. So here is Council's emergency response time targets that you ask us to design our service delivery around. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I will let you, because I'm going over the metrics shortly, I will draw out that you can see there's a difference in turnout times between career and volunteers obviously because the volunteers aren't in station. You can see a difference between the travel times based on geography between an urban footprint and a rural footprint. And you can see that the rural footprint does not have a time requirement for an effective firefighting force or a first alarm assignment, but it is still required. We are uh, gonna be launching uh, educational video for our own staff later today. Uh, we will share that with council because I did not have time to cover it in detail in this presentation today. I typically get asked a lot of questions about that emergency response time target, so we'll share it with you and then we'll make it publicly available afterwards. Um, we will cover these metrics. One thing we did find out is uh, as we go through this accreditation process, we found a, a problem that we will probably need to come back to council to rectify, and that is the difference between uh, turnout times for a rural station that has uh, a volunteer response or a career response, because it's just kind of hit or miss whether there's uh, career firefighters in that station. Not all stations have it, and the accreditation principle says you should have an urban metric and a rural metric, not an urban metric that has two different metrics and a rural metric that has two different metrics, as you can see based on our current standard. So more work to be done on that. So we've tried to make these slides a little bit easier. Uh, we are required to report on them annually. The annual report will be available at the end of this month online. We will share it with you, which is another reporting mechanism we have for the public as well as council. Uh, um, we had hoped to have it here for you today, but uh, unfortunately we probably have another week of fine tuning with that. In this performance um, measurement, we've tried to make it a little bit easier saying that if the arrow up is green, it's statistically significant. If the arrow down is red, it's statistically significant. If the arrow up or down is yellow, it's not statistically significant. So you can see that our urban fires are first on scene. We continue to improve uh, our performance to get to the call quickly. And that uh, technology that I talked to about station alerting should help this performance metric even more, we hope. Uh, you can see that our metrics are really not statistically significant, either up or down. So we're kind of flat in this area when it comes to our rural medical calls for, uh, and our rural fire calls, whether they're with a career crew or a volunteer crew. But this is uh, where we have some concern. So we have added, as we mentioned earlier in the successes, two more firefighters to Black Point, two more firefighters 24 hours a day to the Bedford-Sackville area. We have not kept up with growth. We, this is where we're starting to see the tale of what I talked about earlier. Our performance for achieving an effective firefighting force has fallen for the first time since we have been measuring this. There's a couple reasons for that. One is we've included uh, Fall River in this metric. That We've included it in the measurement, but not in this diagram in the past. So you can see that Fall River is here because it is in the uh, urban footprint. Uh, just to kind of refresh council's memory, in this diagram, blue's good, uh, red is bad, and orange 
could have required an effective firefighting force, but the first in crew typically got there and dealt with the situation and did not require everybody else to come. So Orange could have required uh, an effective firefighting force. And when you take a look at where the Orange is, a lot of those oranges are places we would not have achieved an EFF, and this metric would have probably been worse had they required it. The reason after reviewing the calls that we feel this metric has dropped is the proportion of calls in Sackville this year was higher than the proportion of calls in the Halifax Dartmouth area. So had we got more calls, like the gist of this is if we get more calls in the Dartmouth and Halifax area where we actually have more staffing, our performance will grow up. The further we grow out and the more calls we get out in the urban footprint on our fringes, the more effect it has on our performance metrics. And this is another way to illustrate exactly that same thing. So we started showing you this uh, graph a couple years ago when we tried to help you understand how red the red dots are. Like how far away from the 90th percentile are you in getting 14 firefighters on scene in 11 minutes? And every one of these dots on this graph represents a firefighter. And according to Council's emergency response time targets, every single one of those blue dots should be above the red line or at the red line. And you can see that basically we can get about eight firefighters on scene 90% of the time. And you can see that when Council made that investment in the fire service in 2021, we actually improved our performance in, in 2021 despite adding 10 more firefighters and two, which equals two 24 hours a day in Bedford, Sackville, the increase in call volume and the distribution of where those calls were has actually decreased our performance. Here's uh, the information I said I'd come back to a little bit later and that's on the fire underwriters assessment. So as you can see, the fire underwriters assess uh, quite a few factors, largely the building stock community risk, Staffing models that we have, career and volunteer. Volunteer get a certain rating. Career 24-hour stations get a higher rating. And then they also assess the age of your trucks. If the age of your trucks are greater than 15 years of, old, 15 years of age and they're a frontline truck, it's like you have no truck at all, which means it's like you have no fire department at all. So we, unfortunately, since we had had five years before the last assessment when I got here and five years now, that it's taken them to come back and do the assessment, it's been 10 years between assessments and during that period of time, our fleet has aged dramatically. And we have some trucks that will get a zero. So if they are in a station where we have career staffing, that station gets no credit for having career staffing. If they, uh, and you can see the volunteer assessment says that if you have a volunteer station with less than 15 volunteers, you don't get the rating for having volunteers in that station. So what this really means is that new assessment will trigger insurance rate increases for business and residential insurance if those insurance companies call, fuss, and ask for the evaluation. So now what we are doing is reassessing our service delivery model based on this new information, making sure we don't have 15-year-old trucks in station where we have career firefighters, because that makes no sense. We get no value for that. And we are also reassessing what we believe to be true. We validated this with FUS. And that is, if you have a daytime staffing model in a volunteer station like we have with ePlatoon, it brings no more value in that assessment because it's not a 24-hour station. If it were a 24-hour station and you didn't have enough volunteers, the career staffing model could not only cover that station, but the stations around it. And that will be important as we go through a couple other slides. Chief, Quickly, I'm, I'm wondering I realize. if we could just jump ahead to it. the finances in, uh, to respect the time. Thank you. Sure, we'll probably get more questions, but I will jump to the slides. So we have, uh, do you want the staff counts, Mr. Chair? 
Yes, please. So uh, we were asked to provide this slide as part of our presentation. Um, just so you know, some of the slide, most of the FTEs we have included in this year's budget uh, that are currently baked into the budget are the 15 firefighters that were approved by council to staff at Sheet Harbor, which we've been carrying with overtime. Uh, this will now actually put firefighters there, so it is actually more cost effective to do that. You will see that on the next uh, slide, as well as the other positions are overtime reduction initiatives. We had one assistant chief position filled that was on long-term uh, absence. So here you can see the tail of uh, our budget increases. You can see those overtime reduction costs that were harnessed by adding those 15 new firefighters instead of staffing the station by overtime. And you can see our increase in vacancy management to hit the 8% target. So let's go uh, over, I'm gonna go to the next slide first because it'll be easier to explain and I'll come back to the under slide. So the over slide item that you have in front of you with a briefing note basically says that we have been uh, advised and requested by our volunteer sector in Middle Muscadabit that they request support. I've given you a copy of that letter on your desk. They have uh, just become fatigued with the increasing in call volume, weathering through COVID, and uh, they have requested assistance with that station to be staffed 24 hours. There is value in that assessment based on what I told you with FUS. The overslide is a recommendation to council to add 15 firefighters to our complement to be able to turn that station 24 hours a day if, if we get the 15 firefighters, that means we would not have to redeploy firefighters from other daytime staffing stations. If we do not get the 15 firefighters, the community risk in that community with a hospital and an old age home would require us to transfer firefighters from other daytime stations to address that risk because it's a higher risk. And in the over uh, business note, it tries to make it clear that if council chooses to add firefighters, it would need to be in increments of five to avoid uh, station reassignment because we don't want to go back to having firefighters working two on a truck that is unsafe for the firefighters. So the business note is built that council could make a decision to add 15, they could add 10, they could add five, or obviously you could choose not to add any. If there is none added, then we will uh, redeploy staff from the stations that are identified in your briefing note. Uh, the other uh, over item we have is for emergency management, more detail in your briefing note, largely uh, for increasing our communications capability and getting emergency kits for newcomers to the community, something we started providing uh, in the last couple years. Uh, we've kind of always found a shoestring place to fund it, but the requests are now outstripping our ability to keep up with those emergency kits for newcomers. So uh, now I'll go to the under slide. So we have a lot of detail in the briefing note. We have nine E platoon stations. If, uh, if council chooses to add 15 firefighters, we would convert from nine E platoon or daytime staffing stations to eight because one would be 24 hours. If council chooses not to add 15 firefighters, adds 10 or five, the equivalent number of stations would be removed from the E platoon model to uh, address that risk. If in fact no firefighters are uh, added to our complement, um, that would leave five E platoon stations. In order to hit the 4% target that council asked for, the options were presented with, uh, with the E platoon stations because they are um, outside of council's emergency response time target. So that would convert those stations to volunteer only response and you would harness about $500,000 a station. So for us, a 4% target equated to $2 million, that would be four E platoon stations. Uh, 
if that is the decision of council and four E platoon stations are harnessed, it probably makes no sense to keep one E platoon station operational because the logistics around crew transfers from one shift pattern to another doesn't make sense and we would probably reallocate those firefighters somewhere else uh, and not maintain that E platoon model. I would caution council that if that decision is made, the ramifications are we put all of the response on the volunteer sector. I currently have stations where we have volunteers responding even with an E platoon station one to two to three times a day. And E platoon carries anywhere from 40 to 50% of the call volume in that station. So that would mean volunteers would then be required to respond probably three, four, five times a day and still have a family and still have a job. So it certainly does come with risk, but they are options for council. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Steubing, for that, uh, that presentation. Um, we do have some speakers on the list with, uh, with some questions, so go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Do you want me to put the motion on the floor? Um, so I'll move that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency proposed 2023-24 budget and business plan as set out uh, and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting uh, presentation of the staff report dated February 10, 2023 into the draft 23-24 operating budget. Do we have a seconder? Seconded, Seconded by Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Chief Steubing, and, and all your staff for being here. A couple of, uh, I'll get into, I have so many questions. Um, and some deal with the MBNN, MBN Canada data that you have, uh, and some deal with some other stuff. And it was really hard to try and figure out how we compare to other municipalities, because there are, as you mentioned, very few municipalities like us, and the data isn't readily available to say, okay, here's what Halifax is, or here's what everyone else is. So you have the total cost per fire, or total cost of fire per staffed fire uh, in-service vehicle hour. MBN doesn't do that anymore, but they do have another metric, uh, which is the total cost of fire per thousand population, but that's not included in here. I don't know if you have that. It'd be fairly simple to figure out if you already know the total cost. Uh, just divide it by that, and then we can compare how we are to those others. I wish we were still in MBN. Um, but one was, also I looked at some, uh, and you're probably familiar with Firefighting in Canada, the magazine, uh, I looked at some of the documentation they have there for various standards and recommendations. And one of the things, and this is for urban, and we're obviously mixed, or r rural urban, uh, but they rec recommend four, uh, without, what is it, where'd it go? One career firefighter per thousand population. So we have a mixed uh, complement of, of volunteer and, uh, and uh, career, but assuming that we had 480,000 population, which we have now, uh, one firefighter, we'll call it just firefighter, uh, per thousand pop, give us 480. You had a, a table in there that said we had 597.6 FTEs. How many of those are firefighters? And how do we compare to kind of the recommendation? Uh, that's one question. Um, the other one was on kind of the council approved standards of 90 seconds, 360, 600. How many municipalities meet those standards? Because when I look at the MBN Canada data and you look at the response time, and it's hard to say because they say the 90th percentile, um, actual 90th percentile fire station notification response time. So I have no idea if that means fire, 14 firefighters show up in 11 minutes or whatever that is. But you know, it's 14, 15, almost 16 minutes in some rural areas. It's uh, six and a half, seven minutes. Some of them are seven, almost eight minutes in some urban areas. So I don't know how to compare when we're looking at someone else and we're looking at us and whether our standards are vo feasible for any municipality. Uh, so can you walk me through this? How do we compare to others? Um, are we getting there? And also, I noticed fires are actually the fewest calls yet. And that's been pretty steady. They're a very small number over the whole year. Vehicles and, and investigations and all the other stuff are much higher. And so it's kind of weird. We're always talking about firefighters. Most of what you do is in firefighting. Uh, so also trying to wrap my head around, you know, the capacity for the fires, but then the other stuff that takes up what you do. We're in the process of looking at police and whether police should be doing all the things they do. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is there other bodies that can do some of the stuff you do? I don't know if much of that is legislative or not. Um, so anyway, I will give you some time now to kind of 
walk me through some of these. Oh, and the, I'll, I'll add it. Fire stations. So we have 51, only 48, you said, are kind of real at the moment. Three aren't operating. Across Canada, when you look at the population and the number of uh, fire stations that are across Canada, works out to be about one station per 10,348 people. Uh, we would have one per 10,000 if we had 48 stations operational. Obviously, the ratio would be lower if we had 51 stations operational. Uh, so kind of how do we compare? Again, we're spread out. I don't know if that's apples to apples, apples to oranges. So walk me through some of that. Through the chair to you, Councillor, uh, you've got a lot of questions in, in that, and I'll try to do my best. So the number that you see on the slide with 505 firefighters out of 516, so our complement should be 516, that number includes firefighters, it includes uh, officers, um, so these are career people. 24 hours a day, or full-time firefighters. So it includes firefighters, it includes officers, which are firefighters, captains, and it includes our district chiefs. So these are all people that achieve our effective firefighting force. So council has directed us to have an effective firefighting force of 14 firefighters in 11 minutes. That's the video that I was talking to you about that I said I did not have enough time to present today. I will share that with you. But how we got to our um, emergency response time targets, when I say we, uh, Council's emergency response time targets, was based on a service review that was done by POMOX. POMOX took a look at the old study. They took a look at the services that we cover, I'll come back to that, and they took a look at the two industry standards, which is National Fire Protection Association 1710 for career and full-time departments, and uh, NFPA 1720, which is for composite and volunteer departments. And because we have an urban footprint, and we have a suburban, and we have a rule, they tried to make recommendations that blended those two standards. We clearly have career firefighters in places that you might not normally have career firefighters because of our inability to get enough volunteers and community risk. So 1720, even though NFPA 1720 for volunteer and composite departments, even though it's for volunteer departments, it is still based on community risk. So in a community like Sheet Harbor, with old age home and a hospital and now Middle Musket Abbott in the same situation, you have to respond to that community risk. And that can be with volunteer firefighters, providing you have the volunteer firefighters. If you don't have them, is it acceptable to say, if you're in a hospital and we have a fire, we're not gonna go to that fire? So that was really the decision council had to make because well before I came here, a decision had already been made to put vol career firefighters out to support the volunteer sector. And we have volunteers that support the career sector as well. So for a metropolitan department, I've said this many times, and our performance would tell you it's accurate, we are a lean metro de department. We have very few stations in our urban core where we have more than one truck of four firefighters. Station two, station four, station five, station six. I could just go right across the urban footprint and say the stations that have a truck of four. Most urban stations, Toronto, you know, uh, London, go across Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg. When I was in Winnipeg, our downtown station that is the equivalent of R3 or, thir or 12 had three they had two pumpers with four people on them. They had a rescue truck with four people on them, an aerial with three firefighters on it, plus two squads running medical calls with two people on it, plus a bunch of ambulances. That was one station. You would take all of the firefighters we have in the downtown core to, to, to staff that one station. And the response we have, and this is in the video as well, because I continue to be asked these questions by council, our EFF, our Effective Firefighting Force, is actually for a single family house dwelling. 
which is the lowest risk model of a building that you'll be asked to fight a fire at. What are we building in Halifax? We are building high rises. We would immediately deplete all of our resources in downtown, in the downtown core, not to mention take a long time to get there because we're sending them from Coal Harbor, we're sending them from Sackville, we're sending them from Bedford to go to a high rise fire. The expectation for a high rise fire over seven stories is 43 firefighters. We can't even get more than eight on scene in that amount of time, let alone 43. So it is a challenge for us to deal with this geography that we have in the rural footprint, support the volunteers when we don't have, like we have a station in Beaverbank that is a volunteer station. It has enough trucks and enough volunteers to respond to that community for the most part, save and except water shuttle or a, you know, other support for incident command. It has enough volunteers and trucks in that station that it can, for the most part, handle a single family house dwelling on its own. It's one of the few volunteer stations we have like that. We have other stations like Tintalan and Station 50 that are running, you know, five, six calls a day. And when the career crew go home during, you know, at 5.30 at night, they were car carrying a lot of those calls during the day, but now the volunteers are picking up that, that call volume at night all by themselves. So if we were to pull all the firefighters back in from those E platoon stations, we would probably have more depth in the core. Uh, that's partly why we don't have that per capita number that other departments have, because we're not, we're not densely populated with a very small response area. We have 5,500 square kilometers versus you know, other communities that have like 40 something. So uh, the assessment that was done was a balance of that. I can get you, I'll get our operations deputy to pull up the exact number of firefighters if you want. Um, it'll just take a few minutes to calculate that, but we have 45 firefighters out in our E platoon station because we have nine. So that's simple math. We have nine, fire, nine E platoon stations, we have five per station. So we have 45 firefighters that were at some point taken out of the core and put out into those rural areas. It would help us with our urban footprint response time if we brought them back in, but it would collapse the volunteer sector. So that is our challenge. Um, I don't know the uh, cost, the, what was the other metric you asked per capita? Uh, the MBN now does cost per, uh, total cost per 1,000 population. So we... I don't expect you to calculate it on the fly. I just say that's a metric we could follow. Sorry, just give me a minute. I think we have calculated that. So there's a, it would be. Might have been faster, Mr. Chair, if you let him show the video. Per capita. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the cost per capita based on some assessments, because we, working, we were working with the finance team on trying to uh, produce this, so I'm not surprised it's available. So the cost per capita used to be, in 2021, 211, um, 792. And now, in 21-22, it is 226,077 cost per capita. But again, our geography is a huge challenge. And was there another question that you had that I did not cover? There were a bunch, but I, I think I'll let my colleagues take a stab at you. Sure. We're okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chief, nice to see you and your team, um, including Brendan and uh, representatives of the, uh, of the union. And it was nice to be at the... Um, volunteer uh, graduation the other night, 60-some uh, folks out of, I think, 100 total uh, came through, which was awesome, and Councillors Purdy and Cuddle and Hensby were there as well. It was really cool to see. Um, one of the first things that occurs to me, like, when I look at the, the, the pages, first of all, on page 26, I don't, I don't see the correlation between uh, when you talk about positions and OT reduction, and then I see reduce over time. I see a reduction of overtime of 630,000. 
but up top it seems to imply 15 firefighters plus two training off plus two district chiefs are hired to reduce overtime, but the overtime is only going down by 630,000? Thank you through the chair to you, Mayor Savage. Uh, so different, uh, different factors. So the, the 15 firefighters for Sheet Harbor were uh, a reduction in overtime for I think not only this year, but the next two years. And that's been uh, submitted as part of the OCA process to hire the new FTEs. The district chiefs are positions that we maintain and historically uh, it, there was no savings in those positions but they were funded out of overtime because we would otherwise call somebody in on overtime. So we have for all of our firefighter positions have what we call a ratio. So for every seat that we have as a firefighter seat 24 hours a day we have 0.25 of another firefighter. So for four firefighters so if you have four positions, we have a fifth firefighter to backfill vacation and sick leave and okay. uh, approved leave, paternity leave. The 15 you're talking about are mainly uh, backloaded to other years and that's why it doesn't show up as OT reduction this year? The, the, it was costed into our budget when we got approval to uh, hire them. And then we took another $670,000 out of our budget. Had we not done that conversion, our target would have been much harder to hit. So we did save overtime for the 15 firefighters. The, di the district chief and the training officers have historically been paid out of overtime. So instead of paying them out of overtime, we're hiring people for those positions. Okay. So they're cost neutral. All right, look, I appreciate that. I, just, I, still, I don't really understand how Unless the 15 are only, we're only hiring a couple of them this calendar year. Is that what, if, that, if this in, goes ahead? They're in, they're in training right now, Mr. Mayor. They're in the recruit class okay. and they will be paid at a fourth class firefighter rate instead of a first class firefighter rate on overtime. Overtime is, is not overtime, remember, it's straight time. Yeah, I understand. But it's still at a first class firefighter rate, about double the price of a new yeah. recruit. I just, I, There's the when I look at the numbers and I see two district chiefs, I see an assistant FDM, OT reduction and 15, it, I mean, all those add, would add up to a lot more than $630,000 in terms of salary. And it says they're reducing overtime, but the overtime is only going down by 630. So I, I, I need more information, but I'll, that may be something you can send us afterwards. Uh, sure, it's the difference. But yeah. we can give you that. Yeah, but we're looking at position changes up top and then changes in the budget down below. It's not what's baked in already, it's these are the changes, right? So I just need more information on that. You know, one, more and more I'm convinced we've got to talk to EA, we've got to talk to the province and say, you've got to pay some of these fire costs, man. I mean, our folks are doing so many calls that should be covered by the health. These are not, uh, and they've always been part of the fire responsibility, but. EHS, EHS, or the province. This is this is this is another form of downloading uh, that we're picking up all these these costs. And so, you're having those conversations now, and I, I know that Kathy is going to be having a look at it um, as well. I have to apologize. I'll be in and out today. I've got some uh, calls that I have to join nationally and internationally, and I apologize for that. The last point I want to make is just this. It's uh, it's not a criticism. It's you know I hear we're growing and we're, we are. In 2016, we were 416,000 people. Today, we're 480,000 people. That's a growth of 15.3%. The number of firefighters in that time has grown by 24%, and the budget of the fire service has grown by 44%. That's a lot. Um, and so, and, and, and you know, we had our opportunity to reduce fire years ago. We chose not to, and we want to follow the POMAX. We want to follow the standards. I just think people need to understand we are investing a significant amount of money in Halifax, in this, the oldest and most distinguished fire service in the country. Um, it's a lot of money, and uh, I'm not saying it's wasted or that it's not useful. Um, I think it's very useful, um, but it goes, you can't, you can't say it's growth, because the growth is 15%, uh, and the budget's gone up 44%. Council has supported the fire service because we believe in it. Um, I just don't want people to say, you're not keeping up with growth. We, we sure as heck are. I don't have any comments on that. 
through the chair to the mayor and council, um, certainly understand all emergency services yes. uh, are expensive business. Uh, we continue to demonstrate we're a cost-effective model. We're the only metropolitan department I know in Canada that has uh, straight time overtime uh, in order to backfill vacancies. We have good labor relations that allow us to do new business in a cost-effective way. And, uh, you know, to kind of touch on what Councillor Cleary's question were about, you know, the calls that we go to and fires are not our number one call. The reality is the fire service has been branded as the fire service and, you know, this is a communication we continue to have with other levels of government as well. We are much more than people who fight fires. We deal with hazmat incidents, we deal with car accidents, we deal with hydro emergencies, storm emergencies, critical infrastructure failure, when uh, medical calls, obviously, when something goes wrong, short and you know, short of it needing uh, police officers, typically the fire service is front and center, usually first to respond and able to uh, mitigate the situation. But when I compare our fire service to my peers in large metropolitan departments, we do not have full stop the response capabilities that they have. We do not have the staff to address high rise fires. We do not have the staff to address institutional fires. We do not have the staff to uh, address uh, large big box stores that continue to grow. Having said that, we have a committed group of team and volunteer firefighters who add surge capacity to our model. But those volunteers require support. The cost of the fire service for the volunteer sector across Canada has become problematic. The cost of vehicles has gone up. The cost of training has gone up. WCB coverage is now going to be affecting volunteer fire services across mm -hmm. this own province. So. I see council has invested, yes. Our city grows, yes. Was there a gap before we started to see the growth? Probably is what I'm seeing. So now council has to balance this risk with other growth needs. My job is to give you the information on how we are doing. Your job, unfortunately, is to balance that against everything else. So I appreciate and acknowledge that council has supported us. I agree with everything that you've, uh, you've said. I just want people to understand that we have invested significantly in all of our emergency services. They've all, they've all been going up and it's a, it's a challenging time. Uh, but we put a lot into it and we likely will continue to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would appreciate if, uh, he, if the Chief can take the rest of my time to present the slides in regards to the, to the rural coverage that's being presented. There's some data there that I think it's essential for all of Council to see and appreciate, and I would appreciate that presentation be done in full. Thank you. Go ahead, Chief. Thank you, uh, through the chair, to the councillors. I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, this will summarize uh, and help the br briefing notes that you have in front of you. What you have on um, slide, what slide is this? Slide 23 is information we had presented to council in the past. So this is demonstrating our commitment to the volunteer recruitment efforts that I talked about earlier and reminding council of the community risk assessment tool that we had done uh, previously, which uh, assessed 11 factors to depict this uh, graphic that you have in front of you, historical call volume, uh, critical infrastructure, uh, building stock, including institutions, old age homes, the industry, and our ability to respond to those risks, very similar to what FUS does. And as you could see, back in the day, uh, we lost the intern that did this work, so we couldn't update it, but we were working on a new tool. Um, you could see that the Eastern Shore was painted as high risk. This led to the decision, uh, and I think it was an appropriate decision by council, and another example of commitment and investment in the fire service that led to Sheet Harbor being staffed 24 hours. 
And Sheet Harbor ended up doing what we hoped it would do. It created an anchor for that community, provided a presence in that community 24 hours a day, and we have been focusing a lot of our recruitment efforts, not just down around Sheet Harbor, up in other low uh, volunteer uh, rates uh, that we have in other communities as well, like Black Point and up around uh, the communities around Middle Musket Abbott. You can see our performance increase with recruitment in the volunteer sector. And this is, you know, you need to understand every time we hire a career firefighter and we pull them out of our volunteer sector, uh, which is about a 30% capture rate, now we got to go get another volunteer firefighter. So we have done what almost nobody else has done is turn the tide on our volunteer recruitment. In Canada and North America, this continues to be a problem. Despite this problem, we have not been able to increase our numbers of volunteers in the areas around Middle Musket Abbott. We have worked hard to do it. We're not done yet. But in the meantime, as you can see, we've had a request by the volunteer officers to support their community. And that's what that 24-hour station is about. Because we're worried if we don't support them, the rest of the model will collapse. We will lose the volunteers we have. A lot of the volunteers were older than I when I got here in that community, and like me, they've aged another five years, have weathered the storm of COVID, dealing with that increase in call volume, and are now asking for help. This is the performance that has improved in the community of Sheet Harbor since implementing that station. It is the only place that we hit council's emergency response time target. We have a 90th percentile with that career crew being there. It is an expensive investment, I get that, but it has supported the whole region around Sheet Harbor, and we believe it's partly why we've been successful in our recruitment efforts, because we have a community presence 24 hours a day. This is what will happen if Middle Musket Abbott becomes 24 hours. Like Sheet Harbor, it will not only address the challenge that we have in Middle Musket Abbott with the hospital, the old age home, and the industry, and the hub for the kind of region. You can see its response time can hit the stations around it that have challenges with volunteers as well. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more information to go with the briefing notes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for being able to present that. Thank you, Chief Steubing. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Othit. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Chief and team. Um, and, and there's been some really interesting points made already, uh, you know, by the Mayor, by Councillor Cleary and others on trying to dive down into the numbers, but I also think that you made a comment, Chief, that I suspect is true, that in the past, while we have increased spending, as the Mayor said, significantly, and I'm proud of that, happy to support that, I think in the past, we probably didn't, and you were dealing with a deficit when you, when you got here. I also, while we have invested to keep up with growth, it's very evident to, evident to me that when you look at those, uh, those dots, where the growth has been is not where we hit, the, where our, the fire's growth has been. We're not making the numbers, so we may be spending more money, but we're not putting people where, your team where the growth is, because you're not making the numbers in those areas that are growing. And if I were the, uh, the uh, councillor for Sackville and Fall River right now, as well as Bedford and Hammonds Plains, I wouldn't be very happy about what you presented, and I suspect they're not. Um, you know, is it time to look at detasking and retasking? Is it time to look at e, e platoons? Do we go back to the, uh, do, you know, is it better to have two and two instead of four at once and then nobody at night? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But we've got to look at, at some things in addition to just hiring more bodies, which I'm not op opposed to in some areas. So, Chief, you, le you left me hanging. Here, so I want to I want to have a little fun with here. We, obviously, we're going to talk about the West Bedford Station when it comes back in in the capital context, etc. And I think well, everybody around this table understands that 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 station is needed, and we have whole communities of high rises and seniors and new schools and whatnot that aren't protected. So I'll save that argument for another day. But you painted a picture in in Sackville about how things are not good, and then you jump to Middle Muskogee. Well, I'm sorry, Sackville and Bedford is not satisfactory yet. 
yeah, we've jumped to middle of what's good up, and I'm fine jumping to middle of what's good up, but that's fine. I don't, the one thing I am not is parochial. But you, you've left me hanging here. You, you've, you've set off an alarm bell about Sackville and Bedford, but you haven't come up with any solution. So what are, what are we going to do? <laughs> where there are hospitals, where there are high rises, where there's far more uh, nursing homes, where there are single family dwellings, et cetera. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. You know, this was in my rehearsed bit, but, uh, <laughs> and I had it down to 30 minutes, I swear I did, but I got a little distracted on we blame the, chair. the slides. Yeah, we blame the chair. Uh, so the reason we did the pivot to Middle Muscadabit is we had a request for assistance and a very aging group of volunteers sure. and our goal is to support them and not lose those volunteers while we continue our recruitment effort. This is basically putting our finger in the dike. I would also say we have another 10 firefighters that will be added to the Bedford Sackville area come June. They are okay. in training right now. So we felt it would be appropriate based on the budget pressures to uh, wait and see how our performance improves with those 10 extra firefighters. So you believe there is a forthcoming solution then for Bedford, Sackville, Fall River? Yes, uh, so, so all of the things that we currently have the ability to control are being assessed. So where we have our district chief scheduled, where, or uh, stationed, where we have our platoon captains, where we have anything more than a crew of four. Remember I said we have very few stations with, with more than four people. Everywhere we have more than four people, we're taking a look at the 10 firefighters that will be added to the complement in June that I just talked about right. that are in training, and the 10 that were added to the complement each of those adds up to uh, four 24 hours a day. That is enough to staff the West Bedford Station. Partly that's why we were asking uh, for that, to prepare for that. However, we know even with those four firefighters 24 hours a day, there will be a gap. That's why we're looking at whether or not we can deploy other assets from blue areas, keep them blue, and try to hit more blue areas in our red areas before we ask for more. We're trying to have data inform our decision uh, and reduce the need to continually invest in areas when we might be able to redeploy assets. We are also, you know, assessing whether or not E-Platoon model is in fact the right model, okay. quite frankly, because FOSS has validated what we thought was true. Yeah. They don't add or reduce uh, the cost of fire insurance yeah. because they're not 24 hours a day. But everywhere you lose an E-Platoon station, you put the pressure on the volunteers in that community. So we will continue to assess that and bring more information to council because that would be a change in service. Okay, no, that, that was my, my last point about E-Platoon. Is it better to have four at the wrong time of day or the less, or is it better to have two at all times a day and then you're looking for two volunteers at night instead of four? You know, these are the sorts of things you're gonna have to, to, to look at, I think, Chief, so thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Othick. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Chief, and uh, uh, all your staff for all your hard work uh, and the presentation. But I gotta say, we are having a firefighter standards, firefighting standards discussion at budget, right? Like that's what we're doing right now. We're talking about uh, all the stuff that we did over and over again in uh, many, many very contentious meetings about the right way to structure the force in terms of uh, operational staffing, uh, firefighter locations, and, and how many fire, firefighters should be on a truck. And you know the, the core of our standards was before even before we did the four firefighters on a truck, uh, said when the population density gets to a certain level, we need more firefighters. We need to have a full-time fire station. And then that just sat there and languished for years and nothing happened. And uh, I would argue we need to do a deep dive 
very quickly, and I'm looking at the CAO back there, into uh, what do we really mean by standards? What are the standards we're going to have? And then uh, the fire chief should be coming to us to say, this year, this is what I need to achieve the standards that you own, uh, rather than us, like, I feel like we're doing this piecemeal, and I'm very uncomfortable with it. Uh, and there's a lot of things in the POMOX report and all the stuff that council ultimately largely rejected that I think need to be revisited. Uh, you know, the chief talked about super stations, as we were calling them back then, that uh, would have uh, crews to be able, you know, maybe you have five, six apparatus and you have crews for four of them and they can actually go out and they can, you know, deploy as needed. Do we need the aerial permanently staffed or do we need to have people there who can hop on it if that's what we need, but maybe they're going to go into a smaller vehicle uh, if that's what we need for a medical call or whatever. So there's a piece around what are we going to do around fire stations and what are we going to do around trucks? Uh, you know, and I won't even bother you, Chief, too much about, and, you know, response time, let's talk about smaller trucks in the urban area, type 2 trucks, or the, you know, the Rosenbaum RT that I want us to try out since it's electric, you know, we'll see if we can get some federal money for that, and, and let's do some trials and see whether we can up the urban response time based on having appropriately sized trucks for 250-year-old streets with appropriate safety, uh, pedestrian and bike safety stuff on them. But for me, you know, POMOC said a whole bunch of stuff. We've had many independent studies that have talked about ways to uh, make the system more efficient, to save money, so that money can then be put into deploying more uh, firefighters where they're needed to get closer to our firefighter standards. But I also want to caution council, you know, Google NFPA 1710 or firefighter response standards, and, you know, you can find firefighters and fire chiefs writing blogs all across North America saying, Nobody's hitting those standards. So we have to establish as council what are our standards that we're really going to hold the chief to. Like, that's the aspirational goal. NFPA 1710, love it. Nobody's doing that. But what do we expect to happen on a turnout every time, 90% of the time here? And, uh, you know, we're definitely not hitting that in Sackville. We'll just throw that to our chair, right? So, so part of that, my, I don't even know where I'm at for time. Oh, good, I got enough time to keep going a little bit. Part of that is... When we had our last operational review of fire, we talked about building a bunch of new stations, and I'm now speaking primarily to Councillor Outhead and, and, and Councillor Russell. And we haven't, we've, you know, we bought some land, I think, and we've like scoped them out a little bit. That, I'm looking at the, those reports, that was 2015, 2016. Like, we know we needed to change our posture, and we knew that there's, you know, a fire station that's way out by the county line that hardly got any calls. The data was clear, and we should be maybe redeploying that closer into where it's needed, uh, you know. And none of that's happened. Like, not, not sufficiently to change the water and the beans in terms of operational posture and ability to put a, a, a firefighting force together, the effective firefighting force together. And, and then the final one, and I wish Pam Lovelace was here because she just leap across the chamber to, to, to choke me for saying this, but part of our thing is we said we want four firefighters on a truck because we did not have confidence, the public and the, and the, and the union didn't have confidence that we were getting effective firefighting force together fast enough because we were often sending out trucks to two and three people. Uh, but we still have two firefighters at Black Point, right? And they can't, they can't close a highway if there's an accident. There, you need more than two firefighters. They can't go into a building until there's four firefighters. So I think we have to really deeply look at what we're doing and establish some standards we can live with. And I guess my question to the CAO is, how do we get there? Because this is not what we should be talking about in budget. It should be, here's what you asked for and what it's going to cost you. Cut us a check, right? And we're nowhere near that right now, apparently. That, that's how it feels to me. Thank you for the opportunity to add my wisdom. I don't know how great it will be. But uh, it seems to me that this is a service standard discussion, more so than a budget discussion. But it also seems to me that this is a good year to have that discussion. Um, just not as part of the budget process. And the reason I say that is because we're going to have the regional plan update um, done by the fall. And I think whenever the regional plan is updated, that's the opportunity to do an updated service standard study based on your most up-to-date growth projections, your most up-to-date location of where that growth is going to be happening for the future planning of station development. And also, we'll have new information, like the Chief's good news he shared, for example, about volunteer recruitment being up and some of the approaches he's bringing to staffing. So I would suggest Council focuses in on, you know, 
what does the chief need for this year to effectively operate fire service? What le level of performance are you you're comfortable with for this year? But I do believe looking at service standards um, after the regional plan is updated would make sense. Thank you. I'll come back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chief, and your team here. Thank you very much to, to all the men and women that serve in the uh, Halifax Fire Service. Uh, thank you for their service. Uh, it is appreciated, and uh, our GSR team also, uh, thank you so much. Um, lots to unpack here. Uh, in one of your earlier slides, you talked, and I might have missed it in the presentation, but in one of your earlier slides, you talked about the 22 volunteer stations, but two stations have no volunteers, and I missed that. I didn't understand. Does that mean we have physical stations but no no volunteers at all? So if you could clarify that for me. Uh, and also, when you take a look at the number of firefighters overall, uh, uh, can you identify how many are actually off, that are not, not working uh, due to injury, due to, due to illness, whatever the case may be? Um, and I'm going to still need some help to understand your ask of 15 firefighters. And you talked about response time, four firefighters in a truck to, if we're going to add firefighters, they should be in groups of five. So I, I still need some help understanding that. I'm not clear on that. Okay, you wouldn't mind recapping that. Uh, and do we have examples of where we haven't met the response time and the number of firefighters uh, within the HRM and there's been a negative impact to that? We've either we could have saved the property and we didn't save the property or uh, you know, there was injury. Do we have any examples out in the past year where that, that's happened because we didn't have the effective firefighting situation? So those are my early questions. Uh, thank you. Before someone cuts me off. Uh, so, uh, Through the chair to you, Councillor, the first question I believe you asked was uh, on the number of stations that we have that we have no volunteers for. Mm. Uh, that is currently uh, three stations, uh, Cooksbrook, Mushaboom, and Station 31, which is a substation in Tangier. So um, there's no volunteers in that area, so yeah, and, and I call, would how's that, sorry to cut you out, if there's a call in that area, nobody's coming from those stations, is that correct, is that what you're telling me? So we always send multiple stations to calls. So, right. and because we have no volunteers, they're not set up in our system to be a responding station. But we have certainly in the past, before my time here, brought the possibility of divesting stations to council. Historically, there's not been much of an appetite to do that. Um, but our goal is to double down in our recruitment efforts uh, and try to get volunteers in those stations because some of those stations, you know, Tangier's kind of a, an odd one, but the other two stations, they are stations that are far away from other stations and would be great if we did have volunteers. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an example, Cooksbrook and Mushaboom. Uh, if you didn't have those stations and volunteers, which we don't, uh, then people are coming from farther away and not able to hit the first in truck response metric right. for medical calls or for fire calls. To give you an exact example, I certainly don't have that right now off the top of my head. Uh, it's not data we capture. We get there when we get there and deal with the follow-up for it. But basically, if we don't get there quickly, and be able to stop a fire in its initial stages or keep it in the room of origin, you typically lose the house. Uh, obviously, if somebody's in the house um, and it's in the room of origin and they're not in that room, you might be able to save them. But obviously, if you're not there soon enough, you can't do that. And a huge factor is medical calls. We know for every t minute, this is medical data that's not really disputed, for every minute somebody goes without a pulse, your chance of survival drops by 10%. So if you, right now our standard is first in truck should be there in five minute drive time in an urban footprint. The NFPA standard's actually four. So we're already 25% behind the industry best practice. If you take that five minute time and if somebody w was without a pulse and we're trying to get there to put the defibrillator on, they already are down to a 50-50 chance and then you have the call dispatch processing time and the turnout time of the crew 
possibly the person was not VSA or vital signs absent when the call came in. Our goal is to get there as quickly as possible. If you don't get there in 10 minutes, the likelihood of uh, you know them recovering from that episode would be not very strong. But it's not always cardiac arrest we go to. It could be somebody choking, could be somebody having a seizure, could be an uncontrolled bleed. A lot of life-threatening calls. And now that EMS is challenged, we're seeing more calls for service because they can't get there um, that are not typical for us. I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have any examples right off the top of my head what happens on a particular call when we're not there in a timely manner, but it's well known that, uh, and this is in our video as well, fire grows exponentially every minute, and if you don't get there within the first few minutes, the chances of saving the building and the house are gone and now you're actually impacting the buildings beside it. So that is one of our priorities as well, doing what we call exposure protection. So this, family, this, this house is on fire, it's bad enough you lose that house, but to lose the houses on each side of it becomes a, a priority as well. A number of firefighters off? Sorry, what was the that? The number of firefighters that are off work that are not able to work because of injury or illness was one of my questions. Well, why don't you just step up to the microphone, Chief? I'll get uh, Deputy Meldrum to answer that question. He manages our wellness programs. Thank you very much. Uh, through the chair to uh, the committee member, these numbers float a little bit, so we're doing some, some fast math, right. so I beg your indulgence yep. on that. Uh, we have approximately 13 firefighters on long-term disability leave uh, at this time for a range of factors. About two who are on workers' compensation or on-the-job injury. Uh, members of this committee may know that the IFF managed the LTD and on-the-job injury programs for their members, and we really appreciate that. They do a great job. Uh, this week we have about 33 members on various types of sick leave. As you all know, there's a lot of respiratory illness circulating in community that's certainly impacting us as it is impacting everybody. Uh, we have a small number of other members who are uh, unable to work today for reasons including compassionate leave, family leave, emergency leave, and parental leave. Okay. I'll come back with a question later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Chief Steubing, for your presentation. Um, always interesting and informative. Um, you know, I, I do know that this is budget committee, but part of the process that we go through each year is to hear the business plans for the upcoming year, as well as the budgets, which is an opportunity for us here at Council to actually, you know, get an understanding of what's happening in each business unit, see where the shortcomings are, um, or where opportunities might be to help inform our work throughout the rest of the year. So, you know, while we might be diving into the, you know, standards a little bit here, um, I think it is an important discussion because it really helps inform us about the work that, that we need to do as a, as a council and as a city. So, um, you know, just a, just a few comments. Like one, uh, Councillor Cleary asked a lot of questions about standards and you, and you gave some good numbers there. You know, I, I think what that shows is that we're, now, we're not outrageously out of whack with kind of what's happening in other municipalities um, across the country or um, I can't remember your catchment area for those stats, but um, you, you know we're, we're 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 more or less in line. But we also have a very it's a very challenging municipality. Like one we have uh, you know as we as been mentioned we have the rural and the urban and the growing suburban. Um, as well, we have a historic city with a lot of very old wooden structures. And we're introducing a very new building form with our with our tall with our tall buildings, which we haven't really seen the like of before in the numbers that exist. So it is, you know, requiring us to really think about our, our fire service and how to respond. You know, I remember, you know, with the historic city, like a fire, um, it was on Smith Street in the South End many years ago, um, a, a series of wooden row houses, right? And and and, and I think it was actually destroying one house need to destroy one house to break the fire to save to save the rest right and now now we're dealing with um, with high rises which require a different type of equipment a different response different training a different numbers of um, you know human resources to to address those things so you know I mean that does bring up 
some questions, you know, back to how growth is paying for growth, right? And how, as we're changing our, our building form, how are we collecting fees and creating reserves so that we can ensure that we have the money to effectively create the service standards that we need for this, for this growing city? So I, I was encouraged to hear um, what the CAO just said about with the regional plan is a really good time to take a, take a broad overview of our service standards and, and where we need to invest. But I'd say part of that also needs to be understanding where we can collect those revenues from, right? Because um, otherwise we just end up in the situation where, you know, we're just increasing general taxes when really I think there have to be other, other methods of collecting that money, um, that required money. Um, I'm really happy to hear volunteer recruitment is up. I attended the graduation recently and met some of the, the new volunteer recruits. And you know, it, it's very true. Like we, our firefighters are putting their lives on the line and they're responsible for the lives of our residents. And we see that, we see it all the time. And so, uh, you know, I very much want to just express my appreciation and gratitude to both the career and the volunteer firefighters. But my questions um, come down around efficiency, right? And, and while we're looking at, um, you know, I, I feel we're having a lot of discussion on fire response time, and I'm wondering where else could we be investing resources to um, be addressing the, or reducing the risk around fire. So um, when we met earlier this year, uh, you know, you showed me a map of Spryfield and I, and I had a whole bunch of orange dots in, in Harriet's field. And I know that data is not collected on that because it's outside the service boundary, right? You're only collecting the, 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 the data on what those calls are in the service boundary. So there's a bit of a, a missing gap in information there. But you talked about um, a push, the PUSH program, and I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with the PUSH program or what that is, but I'm wondering how education plays into reducing our risk with fire and working with residents to reduce that risk. And of those calls, you know, um, there's the achieved, the not achieved, and the ones that were not required, right? And so if we're going to a number of calls that don't require service, we're drawing out resources from stations and possibly lessening our response to situations that actually require, um, you know, a full complement of, of firefighters. So I don't know if you can speak a little bit to that about, you know, the, how we can reduce those not require, you know, the, the situations where things aren't required. And I know, you know, again, um, you know, the mayor spoke to this that the firefighters are doing. A, a lot of things more than just fighting fires and responding to emergency calls. But I'm, I'm just trying to think outside the box here about how we can be more, create some more efficiencies there, as well as Councillor in building Cuddle. standards. Councillor Cuddle, I okay. oh, appreciate I'm it over. if we could let the chief respond. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, through the councillor, uh, great question. So before COVID, we did a lot of things like the PUSH program, public education. We had requests for public education and, you know, visiting a school or station tours to uh, educate the general public. And all of that stuff came to a grinding stop during COVID. So since COVID has slowly started to dissipate, not that it's gone by any means and we're getting some normalcy in our lives, our, we actually did have a slide on public education and took it out based on the time. We have started to see those requests come in again from 311 from the schools and we've started to initiate our fire uh, service inspection by our ops crews and our push and uh, alarmed and ready programs which are public education programs particularly around uh, smoke alarms and uh, the value of having them. So that's part of our part of our community risk reduction. As far as your comments about what we can do about the orange do dots that didn't end up requiring an EFF, uh, sometimes those are things that had we not responded in a timely manner, they would have required an EFF. So we start rolling trucks from many stations to hit the EFF to a call. 
a report of a fire in a kitchen and the first in crew gets there and puts it out, uh, it's a cooking fire and puts it out quickly, keeps it in the room of what we call keep it in the room of origin and hopefully not extending uh, beyond the, the cooking surface. But had you not got there timely and because a lot of times people just run out of the house <laughs> when, the, when the fire happens. If you don't get there in a timely manner, all of a sudden the drapes catch on fire, the cubs or covers catch on fire. The contents in a house, this is why the response time targets are continuing to be a challenge. The contents in the average home are almost all petroleum based now. So the severity of the fires, they grow much hotter, much faster than they ever did. The old rule of thumb for us was you had 20 minutes to deal with a fire. Now they, you know, a fire can hit what we call flashover in less than four minutes. So the goal is to get rolling there as soon as possible, have people call for assistance as soon as possible. Yes, they may take a fire extinguisher and try to put the fire out, uh, but if we don't get there quickly, and stop it from requiring the FF, it's probably gonna be a much bigger firefight for us. So our goal is to keep all of them orange, quite honestly, uh, but you don't know if you need the resources until you get there, and if you don't start rolling them quickly, uh, you won't get there in time. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Dagle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, Chief and team with you. Um, boy, I've got a bunch of questions and I'll, I'll try to get the hodgepodge done first and then do the theme of volunteers later. But um, a couple of things on the presentation that I was, um, from last year's presentation to this one that's a little bit different is that um, you sort of had a, a scorecard, I think last year, lack of a better word, but it talked about um, satisfaction uh, rating and then review survey results that were done. Um, and so professional firefighters do one survey around employee satisfaction, volunteer firefighters do a different one. Um, so I think, you know, another year I'll ask you, it would be really nice um, to see if it is one survey that is done by everyone, which gives to me, I think, a much more holistic view of the health of the organization. Um, so that's one thing, but uh, the high-speed internet in some of the stations that is not available to the adjacent community hall. I have been in different places where they've said, we don't have access to that internet and it would be really nice if we did. So I think I heard you mention that that might be coming, but just to clarify. And when we look at where the new volunteer firefighters are coming from, um, are they mostly urban and suburban? Where are they? Um, are we doing exit interviews with our volunteer firefighters to find out what are the issues that make them leave? Um, other than age, right? I met one guy who was like, I think 76 and said, I'm done, Kathy, <laughs> counselor. But uh, yes, yeah, so what are the reasons that people are leaving and how are we applying those reasons to an updated strategy. Um, when I look at this, I actually don't see what the strategy is for the recruitment of volunteers. I know that you know you're doing something, but to be able to you know look at the website or to read a business plan that says this is our strategy, I would really like to be able to see that. Um, all right. So the the slides that we missed that was great. Um, the gem teams, I um, guess I'm wondering in the business plan, and thank you, Councillor Cuddle, because I was gonna say the same thing. It's like, it is the budget, but it's also the business plan. So in the business plan, what are we doing to be able to encourage uh, and motivate uh, gem teams to you know, uh, increase their capacity, but also to find some in communities where we don't have them right now? Um, thank you so much to, um, Captain K. McGinnis and Harvey uh, for writing a letter that I'm sure wasn't easy to write because I'm sure that that was, you know, something when you're looking at your, you're the captains of the volunteer stations and stuff and you're saying, we just don't have them and we need them. So um, I'm sure that that's gonna be important. Um, when we look at, you know, the, the budget piece and we see 15 firefighters, but then I see seven almost management positions with 15 volunteer firefighters. And uh, some of the comments that I do get is people perceive 
uh, whether it's true or not, but people perceive fire as very top heavy. So when you had said for every four firefighters, you need a fifth to backfill sick vacation, how many firefighters then determine a need for that other level of, of a management type of position? And I don't know if you call them district chiefs, supervisors, that kind of stuff. So I'm curious about that. Oh, got one minute left. Um, and uh, just for my colleagues, leave ground search and rescue alone. Um, maybe not a time to ask about uh, increasing their budget, but uh, maybe we'll all use a little bit more district capital to support our ground search and rescue because they do amazing jobs. Yeah, Thank you very here. much. So that's it, and I'm probably gonna come back with one of the over requests. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Councillor. Through the chair to answer your question, I'll get Deputy Chief Meldrum to step up to talk a little bit about our recruitment strategy. Our uh, manager who is responsible for that is uh, back at our headquarters and hopefully he'll be able to touch base with her. Uh, first of all, on the scorecard about um, surveys. So we participate in the corporate employee survey. Uh, so all of our career firefighters and, uh, and chief officers need to participate in the um, employee survey, but volunteers uh, don't participate in that survey. So we've talked uh, many times to HR about the need to hear the voice of our volunteers. So we have created a survey internally that kind of models the <coughs> questions of the, of the employee survey, custom, you know, satisfaction survey and engagement <coughs> survey. So we took it upon ourselves to always, when we okay. survey employees and survey our volunteers and then we match those results together. Okay. Uh, so it is a little bit more work for our team, but we think it's important to hear both voices. The high-speed internet um, solution was uh, a pilot we did. Uh, it's found to be successful. So the first thing I did with my team after we were happy with it is said, okay, I, you know, what we should probably do is try to make this be available, particularly uh, where we have community uh, community rooms or something yep. attached to the station. So uh, I believe the team is working on that uh, with the IT group because of security, just make sure that, you know, there's no security issues with people tapping into okay. the corporate backbone. But that is our goal to try to make that available if at all possible. Maybe I'll get you to talk a little bit about our current uh, recruiting strategy, but maybe just before I hand the talking stick over, you asked about where we're seeing the increase in volunteers. There are some places we never have a hard time getting volunteers, whether that's you know in the urban core, because we have lots, and when I say the urban core, I'm including Coal Harbor and Bedford and Sackville. Uh, Sackville may be a div different situation. We are seeing some successes there, but historically we've struggled a little bit in Sackville, but Bedford, uh, and, the, and Coal Harbor, we've got healthy compliments, as well as Fall River and Tin Talon. We've not struggled in those areas. Uh, where we have struggled is the far reaches. In your yep. community, in your councilor's district, obviously in the Eastern Shore and out around Black Point. Uh, but we've concentrated a lot of our efforts in those areas, and I'll get the chief to explain, uh, the deputy chief to explain some of those strategies. Absolutely, <clears throat> thank you. And through the chair uh, to you, Councillor, volunteer recruitment is absolutely a priority of us. And while it's true we don't have a comprehensive strategy document to hand you today, we have numerous internal documents and our strategies and tactics are evolving, and I will say weekly, as we reach out. It's a big challenge, we ask a lot, and I know you know this. Our volunteers, uh, we ask them to live within six minutes of the station that they're gonna respond from. We need them to be physically able to do dangerous and difficult work. We need them to commit a very large part of their personal lives to serve their communities, many, many hundreds of hours. So we ask a lot and we know it. And we're 
evolving strategies on an ongoing basis. So uh, for example, there are many. We look at our recognition programs every year and how do we tweak them. Our volunteers don't do this for money, but they deserve recognition, rightfully so, for the great work they do for community. So we're looking at those recognition programs. We've done extensive overhaul in, in our program that we call support members. Many members of this committee, many, many members of council will know some volunteers who can't do the full duties of interior structural firefighting can still serve community in other roles. So we have four category of roles for those folks who can serve community and we're evolving those and we're promoting those. Uh, we're looking at how we train and onboard firefighters. We're looking at streamlining the onboarding system now to go to something that's more electronic. That's hard because some of our community's access to electronic systems is limited. But getting the delays out of the system from the time of I want to do that to the time that they get into their bunker gear. We're looking at cutting that back. We're doing more and more to recognize the skills that people bring with them if they're already a truck driver, if they have service as a firefighter somewhere else. We're incorporating those on a daily basis. Um, where are they coming from? We would, you know, we are increasing our volunteer intake from our rural communities, and that's big, big news. And this year, we're so happy to say that we're actually looking at having full uh, spring and fall training classes where we may have to defer some more urban applicants in favor of rural applicants where our need is greatest. Uh, so that is so, that are some of the strategies that we are practicing uh, at this time. I'll have to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much um, for your service, and uh, especially for all the volunteers that choose to do this of their own volition. That's amazing, and for search and rescue, we're all very grateful and thank and thankful. Um, I <laughs> and I have a fire extinguisher in my kitchen, <laughs> ready to go at any moment. <laughs> I may or may not have started a few fires on my stove in the past. <laughs> I might sign. I need. I need it all. Yeah, I might sign up for that. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna just kind of pivot, change gears here, and ask about the hydrant servicing. Um, this has been brought to my attention and uh, colleagues, we do have new correspondence there in the package. Um, so fire hydrants are obviously a critical piece of infrastructure for fire protection and um, I guess the National Fire Protection Association standards for hydrant service, servicing is, is an annual servicing including water flow. So I guess I'm wondering where would this information for the hydrant servicing standards and the servicing standards schedules be housed? And, and how could this information be accessed by the public who might be concerned about a hydrant, say, on their street? How would uh, someone get access to this information? Um, uh, and... Second question, just regarding the volunteers, are they included in like communication? So like when, you know, memos go out to uh, your employees, are, are they in, included in that or no? Does that come through like a separate uh, way for them to get that information? So. All different. <laughs> I have a little bit of knowledge of hydrants. Um, Halifax Water has hydrant standards and they're following a, um, <coughs> a, a um, professional standard organization and the uh, American Water Works Association standards regarding hydrant maintenance. Um, I'll get Halifax Water to send information to you on that if you're interested, but yeah. on a regular basis they do a hydrant testing program and they also do hydrant maintenance that includes rebuilding hydrants as required or replacing them. So is that information available? So say if a resident were to call customer service and ask for say a servicing schedule or like a history of a, high, a particular hydrant, is that information available to the resident? The standards would be available. I'm not sure if information related to a specific hydrant would be available. 
but they would certainly have, the call center would have readily available information about the standards and the frequency with which they're doing servicing. And I suspect they could also get information within a reasonable time period about the last time an area or a street was serviced. Mm -hmm. But if it was right down to the level of an individual hydrant, that would be something that uh, the call center wouldn't have, but operations would. Okay. Um. Okay. I'll, okay, I'll follow up then with maybe Halifax Water on this one. Thank you. Through the chair to answer your, the rest of your question on hydrants. So thank you, um, boss. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Halifax Water obviously uh, is responsible for the hydrants, but we, uh, Fire is responsible for our dry hydrants. So you might recall in your capital budget, there is a line item there that uh, is for maintenance and testing annually of dry hydrants, which we do. Uh, we also try to expand our dry hydrant footprint every year. Um, based on community need and risk assessments um, and try to increase our ability to have more dry hydrants, particularly as we see urban sprawl. So that, that responsibility lies with us versus the hydrants on the water network, which is Halifax Water. Uh, as far as your question about the volunteers, yes, we communicate with the volunteers on a regular basis. Sometimes we communicate them to them directly because it's a volunteer only issue. Sometimes it's a career only issue, um, but most of our communication, I would say, goes out to the general membership, uh, which we okay. call members. Do, and just a question about training, if I have time. Would um, you mind coming back? Yeah, totally, mm -hmm. thanks. Beautiful, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'm going to follow up a little bit on uh, from uh, where the uh, the mayor started about uh, the the medical calls. And I mean, the uh, the data is pretty clear that this is uh, certainly something that is uh, creeping up. Um, and I wonder, do we have the ability to? Uh, I mean, for want of a better term, to charge the province for medical calls. Is that something that is done elsewhere? Is that something that could be negotiated in a, a service exchange agreement? Because, I mean, it's obvious EHS is struggling like all sectors of the healthcare uh, system. And once again, it's left to the municipality to pick up the, the pieces, uh, you know, just like with housing and emergency housing and homelessness. The, uh, the service is downloaded to us because it's allowed to. And it just, um, it just really burns my biscuits that the province is sitting on a surplus and we're struggling, uh, you know, be, in large part because of uh, actions that we are taking to fill gaps service gaps that have been left by the province. So just wondering is, is, you know, is that something that is done elsewhere in, in Canada? Do we even have that ability? Something that maybe could be written into a service exchange agreement? I mean, I, I know that, you know, both, uh, you guys work very well together with, with EHS, but uh, I just sort of see this as, uh, as another uh, creeping expense that, uh, that shouldn't be ours and, uh, you know, it, uh, it just kind of leaves me with a bad taste. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor, thank you for your question. As far as uh, how we compare across Canada, I've worked in many jurisdictions across Canada uh, that has had various roles as it re pertains to medical response, including running EMS service delivery in two of those locations. It is a collage of what happens everywhere. It's different everywhere you go, mm -hmm. and it is different everywhere in this province, largely because of the governance structure for fire services in the province is very unique, to say the least. So we are one of the few fire services in Canada that has, or in Nova Scotia that has a strong relationship with our council, i.e. you set our standards and I report to you annually on how we do for those performance metrics. 
there is opportunity for cost recovery. So when we had shared with you we were going to get back into being an official medical first responder program a couple years ago, uh, what goes along with that is uh, consumables can be recovered. So uh, your medical supplies that you covered can be uh, covered. Historically, when we withdrew from that program some time ago, we were not able to recover those costs. So you either have to be all in or mm -hmm. all out of the medical first responder program. So the conversations we're having with the province, now that we are fully trained, we are registering as an MFR agency, all of our uh, first responders, all of our firefighters, who have that training, which is all of them, will be registered medical first responders, which means we are now a medical first response agency and can uh, get consumables compensated. Uh, that includes defibrillators. So our defibrillators happen to be up for renewal, so that will yield hundreds of thousands of dollars possibly in savings with the equipment. Um, I can't speculate at this point, but as mentioned earlier, we are continuing to have conversations with EHS about how we can support them in their time of need, but also realize that we have a mission of our own that we need to perform. Um, historically, uh, even in volunteer communities, Fire services that have con contemplated withdrawing from medical response have had challenges from their volunteer sector because that's the place they feel they actually have the biggest impact. They go to more medical calls. They typically know the person they're responding to. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember during COVID, medical calls were shut off uh, by the province mm -hmm. uh, and there were some bad outcomes as mm -hmm. a result of that. So uh, we want to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater is what I'm trying to say. Sure. Uh, we want to work with our partners to support them but also kind of be recognized for our contributions. So the first step yeah. of that is reimbursement for what we're already entitled to uh, as part of the medical first responder program and then growing that program and possibly uh, being able to work with them on some cost mm. containment challenges. Yeah, what about what about training? Because I mean, I would say that uh, as you're being, re you know, as being relied on more and more for these medical calls, I would think that these calls are getting more and more complex and so the level of training required would be at a higher level as well. That is part of the conversation, yes. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go to the Deputy Mayor next. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just to, to start as a note, um, you know, <laughs> everything always comes back to good planning in so many ways in everything we do, right? We don't like the cost of the, of the fire department, right, of, of rising costs there. Um, well, every subdivision we put in with uh, homes on big sprawling lots out on the edge of town where we don't have effective services, Guess what? It doesn't break even, and then it comes back uh, to all of us at this time. You know, it's the same with the pro provincial road download in so many ways. So, you know, a, a good plan is also good finances for the municipality in terms of being able to grow in the right places. Uh, I have three questions, Chief. The first one being on, and you know, I'm glad Councillor Blackburn spoke just ahead of me because uh, same same place. Um, the medical ambulance calls, and I'm just going to ask bluntly. Um, the uptick, uh, that like kind of almost hockey graph with it going way up. What I like, I don't understand as a layperson, right? You know how the dispatch works. So someone, you know, is in a car crash on the side of the road. Um, they're calling 911 because they need an ambulance, or you know, actually a better example would be like they're at their house and someone's having a heart attack. They call an ambulance. They call 911. Are we dispatched for every medical call, or is it like when it comes in, uh, if an ambulance is available near, the ambulance goes and we don't necessarily go? Through the chair to you, Councillor, thank you for the question. The way a call evolves is you call 911, that typically goes to our IES dispatch center. There's other 911 centers as well in the province. Uh, if you request an ambulance, it gets diverted to the ambulance dispatch center. They interrogate the call 
to figure out what the nature of the emergency is and higher priority calls, typically called echoes, uh, are sent back to us after they've dispatched an ambulance to request us to respond until the ambulance gets there. So they're not all calls, they are typically higher acuity calls and they are not necessarily consistent in our, even our own municipality, we're working to try to get that consistency. They are uh, something left over from days of yore where different communities have different response capabilities, um, largely because back in the day we were a bunch of different departments. Yeah. So we've tried to make it consistent, but then on top of that, if they become overwhelmed, sometimes they might call us for calls because it looks like it's going to be a long time and they want to get someone there. And that's what I, where I was going because, I mean, we all know that there's, there's problems. I mean, fellow in Councillor Mancini's district sat on his driveway last year for four hours waiting for an ambulance to come that uh, eventually he got carried in the back of a police car to the hospital. There was the fellow who got stabbed down at Alderney and was on the ground for an hour before he was taken to hospital, even though the Dartmouth General is really not far away. Finally, ambulance did take him. I mean, he, he didn't make it, uh, was alive when he left. So, I mean, there's real problems in the uh, paramedic system that I think everyone in this province is very well aware of. You just have to look at the paper. Um, I'm wondering, so that big blue spike, is that reflective of more of calls coming to us because of the problems in the provincial health system? Fun question, eh, Chief? <laughs> uh, thank you, I think, uh, through the chair to the councillor. I think what we are seeing is uh, accumulation of multiple factors, uh, calls that we've not that we would not normally go to because the system is under strain calls because while we were on a call, uh, possibly they got diverted to another call. Uh, they're being caught in offload delays. In addition to the increasing number of calls, what I think it's important for council to understand is the time on the calls have increased. So we are waiting when we are actually at a call for longer periods of time for an ambulance to arrive because historically they're coming from a farther distance because a lot of the local ambulances might be caught up in, uh, in the hospital offload delays. So that's partly what we're having conversations with the EHS uh, team about as well, how we can try to get back in service because once you make access to a patient, you don't typically leave them, you might be considered to be abandoning your patients. So we're literally in the same situation with you folks as we are with police where uh, you arrive on the scene and then you can't leave the scene until you can hand things off and the way that police are sitting in an emergency room waiting for intake there, you're saying like a, a crew of firefighters uh, can be sit, this can be basically tied up on uh, the same in the same sort of scenario, waiting for that space in the healthcare system to free to free up to uh, so that they can take the patient. Yes, I would not say to the same kind of gravity that they are experiencing. But, and this similar, is but similar dynamic. Similar dynamic and a relatively new uh, situation for us because of this increase in call volume, which is why the conversations are going on. So to Councillor Blackburn's analogy, I don't think it's burnt biscuits, I don't think it's burning biscuits, I think it's charred, charred black biscuits on that pan. Um, you know, it, it really is like you're sitting there with a provincial surplus and these are all downloads on us, right? That are then impacting services and tiring up police, tiring up fire crews and ultimately not serving the citizens that we all represent in this province. Um, uh, one other- Councillor Austin, you are over time. Did I use five or did you, I use- You are at six. Oh, okay, thank you, I'll come back. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Chief Steubing and your staff. We really appreciate you. Um, I was gonna comment on Councillor Blackburn and her <laughs> burn biscuits as well, and I was gonna ask her to contact Councillor Purdy. <laughs> Anyway, seriously, um, <laughs> um, I may have missed it, Chief, but we had talked before about a way to monitor our volunteers, and we love our volunteers, no um, criticism on them, but 
I just wondered how we depend on them and how you depend on them. You know, I mean, they have illnesses too or situations or emergencies that happen in their family. So I'm just wondering, like, where you're dependent on them, you know, how do you, how do you monitor them to see if, well, I guess to see if they're gonna be able to attend? Uh, my other question was, kind of along the same lines as Councillor Cuddle, is how are you able to depend on all the rising numbers of floors that are gonna be in and are in our residential areas? Like, do you have the elevated ladder system? I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but I'm just, like, it just uh, concerns me that the buildings are getting higher and higher, and, you know, how are you able to compete, you know, com well, not compete, but how are you able to deal with all of that? Thank you. Uh, through the chair to you, Councillor, thank you for the question. Um, so you might have heard me mention in the past uh, about uh, kind of 50% expectation rate from your volunteers. Uh, and there's, noth there's nothing scientific about that by any means, but historically it's been my experience and other people's experience that if you are hoping to achieve a response of 12 or 14 firefighters um, from a particular area from volunteers, you should probably have a complement of about twice that number. Uh, because people might be out of town on vacation, they might be out of town on work, they might have a family uh, situation that right. requires them not to be able to attend, they might be ill. Uh, one of the things that we've done to better understand who is coming to a call when we send off the pagers, so let me back up a little bit. We use pagers as our kind of mission critical communication. So if you're a volunteer, you get issued a pager and that page that pager is typically really rock solid when it comes to when you send out the page, it's going out. It's not relying on the internet, it's not relying on a lot of stuff. It is relying on the towers that we have the pager towers, but it is our kind of mission critical communication with volunteers. But it's a one way push. So the pager goes off, the volunteers get that page, you have no idea whether or not they've received it or they're coming to the call. So in addition to that, we've implemented some technology called I Am Responding that uses cell phone technology that's reliant on a couple of kind of mission critical connections. One is the dispatch CAD to uh, the internet and uh, cell phone technology. So the volunteers download this app on their phone and get pushed, besides the pager, they get the information on their phone and then on their phone, you can see whether or not, because their phone communicates with technology in the station, it tells us whether or not they are responding or not. So it's helpful, it's not perfect uh, by any means. We're looking at, you know, depending on what council's decision is about the e-platoon or daytime staffing stations, uh, we are possibly going to have to consider other opportunities as well to distribute the work to the volunteers that right now the e-platoon the e stations are picking up, which is not quite, but almost 50% of the call volume. That's great, that sounds like a great access asset to have. Um, were you able to uh, think about my other question, please? Yes, could, you, could you just repeat it for me, please, Councillor? Um, it was um, in connection with um, Councillor Cuddle's question about how we we're able to deal with oh. the rising number of floors. Sorry, I couldn't read my writing here. <laughs> Apologize for that. So it continues to be something that we're concerned about it is in the uh, it is in the tutorial video that we're sharing with our staff and we'll share with you as well because it's not a in council's emergency response time targets you have not said what your expectation is for us for high rises and big box stores and you know strip malls which are not a single family house dwelling right. so we are 
improving our data capabilities. We are looking at dispatching more resources to those calls uh, more often. We just sent uh, some people off to training in communities that have a lot more high rises. We are currently um, changing some, improving the equipment we carry on our trucks mm -hmm. to deal with those calls. But uh, you know, one of it is one of the challenges we have is resourcing for sure, uh, and the other is uh, the assets that you talked about, the aerial trucks. So we have two aerials that are in service 24 hours a day. One in Halifax, one in Dartmouth. They are at Station 12 and and three, and they are in close proximity to the bridges. So we can use the bridges to kind of get both of those vehicles to the other side of the harbor if needed. But they are the, you know, one of the few stations we have, like I said, that has more than uh, a crew of four. Okay. So typically the number one function for the first in unit is to operate what we call a pump, which is a truck that has a big pump on it that hooks to the hydrant, pumps water out it. That is usually the role of the first in crew to go in and you know do the size up, maybe make a, a aggressive interior attack, take the hose off that truck with the pump and go in and attack the the fire. But in a high rise fire, that you're not going to be running up with the first four people immediately to the 30th story. Your strategies and tactics need to change. They become very laborious. Uh, we are hoping to do uh, a Fire Ops 101 with Council to help you understand why you need so many people on scene because there's lots of work that needs to be done at the same time. So some of it is staffing, some of it is equipment, some of it is vehicles. We do have things called quids, and you might have heard me talk about it before, which is a combination truck that has a pump on it, but it has an aerial on it as well. Uh, the problem with quints uh, in our geography is it is very hard on those type of trucks. If you're running them to every single call, you're running them to the medical calls, you're running them to the smaller calls that don't require the ladder. So they put a lot of strain on that truck to run to everyday calls. We don't use ladders every day, but when you need them, you need them. So we are continuing to assess not only our staffing and our equipment and our response capabilities to address those issues, uh, we are also looking at training and, uh, and where we deploy those assets to best respond when needed. We also feel we will be bringing a report back to Council at some point to reassess our emergency response time targets based on what I said earlier. Right now we have kind of two profiles in the urban footprint, career and volunteer, and two response profiles in the volunteer sector or rural sector, career and volunteer, and the industry best practices is to have one because the fact that you happen to have a career crew in a rural station doesn't necessarily mean you should expect a totally different response for the whole community because they may or may not be there, like our e-platoon stations only there during the day. So we're recessing all of that and also our what we call second and third alarm for high-rise fires. Mr. Chair, may I just ask the age of those two trucks, please? Uh, actually, there's some good news uh, through the chair to you, Councillor. Uh, working with our CFO, who back in the day was in charge of fleet, we did update our two aerials, so our two mid-mount aerials that are our first-run vehicles are relatively new. I think they're under three years old. So they are in good shape, uh, as well as the first uh, backup, which is another 100-foot platform aerial. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Councillor Stoddard. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to follow up in the, in the footsteps of Councillor Stoddard, I want to talk about their fleet and stuff. Is it possible for us to get a list of our fleet and amount of trucks that are, the age of the trucks, the kilometers per truck, and what stations they're located at? I'm not sure if our fleet management would have that or what the case would be. I'm kind of, kind of curious because I, I think that, to me, this underwriter's survey and stuff and how it ages of a truck at 15 years or older, automatic zero, 
<laughs> Sometimes I want to put self-serving in the industry, in the, in the, in the industry itself, in regards to, to replacement of vehicles and stuff. So um, I thought our vehicles were depreciated in value at tw uh, over a 20-year period and stuff, but here they're going to accelerate at 15 years. Um, and also, when we have our surplus vehicles, or to the, we age them out, I guess you could say, and write them off, we usually put them up for auction and other fire departments across the province or elsewhere will buy the, buy the equipment to have because they may not have the capacity to buy them brand new, but they buy them used and stuff. So, and, and, and I don't think they're worried too much about the fuss criteria as well, so, uh, or, or as concerned as we may be. Uh, I know we are the capital region of the province and stuff. We have to have the most up-to-date fire equipment and stuff as possible. But I'm kind of wondering if some of this accelerated depreciation may be uh, more industry standard versus uh, realistic in regards to being practical. Through the chair to you, Councillor, certainly we can work with uh, our fleet teammates to get that information. Uh, if, you're, if it's all right, we'll email that out to council following this council session. Uh, I would say that where the trucks are is very dynamic because you know that changes uh, almost daily based on what work is being done on the trucks. Uh, but we can certainly tell you what is assigned at a particular station, you know, whether it's a pump or a tanker or an aerial. And, uh, and we can get you the age uh, and the number of trucks. Just for clarity, what Fuss said is frontline trucks have to be 15 years of age. That does not include your spare trucks. So uh, I think the goal by most uh, career departments and full-time and bigger departments is to keep their frontline trucks 15 years or newer because when they get older, you actually spend more time repairing the trucks. But you, they typically transition from a frontline truck, meaning the truck that's in the station every day, to a spare truck. And then they can be a spare for uh, another five or so years. We'll get that information for you too. We'll tell you how many trucks we have, whether they're frontline or, or spares, and, uh, and what their age is. Thank you, I appreciate that. And the only other thing, Mr. Chairman, I, I will not be supporting any proposed cuts to ground search and rescue uh, and their GSAR grants and stuff. Uh, I think they're highly valuable volunteer organizations in our community and they should be supported and not reduced in service at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, same, I feel like you fellows are going to watch us say that over and over again, and I apologize for that. I don't think anybody's going to cut you. Don't worry about that. I understand you have to be here for it, though. Uh, I wanted to clarify, especially for my uh, union friends in the audience, uh, when I talk about super stations, one of the things, or reallocating stations and having more resources in, in less spaces, uh, which is something that we studied, that, you know, I had this conversation with Jim, with your predecessor, right? It's like when I made the motion to make sure that we had four people on it, four tr firefighters on a truck, and, and we did that in response to what we heard from the union and saw in the, in the reports, uh, that gave comfort to the public and to the union and, and uh, council that we would have adequate staff when we had a fire response. I think we'd have to do the same thing. What I heard, what we heard, and this is to council, what we heard from the union at the time is that a legitimate concern that we would build five or six or seven bay stations and still only have four firefighters for all the trucks that were parked in there. And obviously that would not be the intent. The intent is not to save on staff, it's to have a more efficient deployment. And, and we could guarantee that in bylaw the same way we did in, in the, uh, uh, that we did with the number of uh, firefighters on a truck. Which goes to my next point, which is on the medical response. I wonder if, you know, the, the, it's four firefighters on a firefighting apparatus like an engine, but we did have uh, allowances in there for smaller trucks. I wonder if we should have pickup trucks or panel vans or something doing medical response in the core or where we're seeing the most medical response and, and staff that up separately. And I know that gets us dangerously close to running our own e emergency medical EHS system, except our, if our choices are do it or not do it and let people potentially have serious health impacts or die, obviously we're gonna do it. And if that point, is there a way that we can have a more streamlined delivery of that that uh, protects firefighting response, but ensures that we have that medical response uh, and maybe does it in a, uh, a more uh, efficient, cost-efficient way? 
And then my final series of points is, what I'd like to see when we come back with the CAO and with the chief later is really solid numbers and comparators. Like I see the map that shows we have a red response in rural that the student did some time ago. Uh, what, what was missing then and is missing now is what are good, what are the response times like in other rural counties? What are the response times like in other rural counties in Nova Scotia, in Lunenburg and in Kings County? What are they like in the very best, best funded rural counties? You know, uh, what, what is that standard that we should be striving for? Similarly, uh, on fleet, you know, let's establish a policy as council and tell the CAO, come to us and make sure that the, all the frontline trucks are within the standard. Uh, this to me, is, uh, that what I'm hearing from you is similar to what we've heard uh, from transit, and we've gone from 20-year-old buses to 14-year-old buses, and we've even talked about having 12-year maximum on buses because the maintenance, the wrench time needed to keep them in the field drops. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. And then the final numbers that I would like to see would be uh, management numbers. So we're talking a lot about frontline people, but I don't know what the normal complement of chiefs and, and uh, non-line uh, uh, captains and that kind of thing are as a percentage of population compared to across the rest of the country. Don't expect to have answers for those today, but I would like to have those when we come back to do policy. But yeah, if you could talk a little bit about the medical response piece, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question through the chair to you, councillor, and the rest of council. Um, the, the idea that you proposed for medical responses is not dissimilar to what we ran in Winnipeg when I said we had two squads in that big station. Uh, so the challenge is if you take those two people to go onto that squad unit, you might not, you know, burn out your big truck, which is good. Uh, you need extra staff, otherwise you've dropped your pumper yeah, to yeah, four sure. people. So typically they're kind of additional people. Uh, what I can tell you is as we uh, are working on where to deploy our people, we are looking at that possibility and uh, seeing if that in fact makes sense. So with the EFF, what we try to uh, achieve is not just firefighters on scene, but the vehicles that we need to be able to do that. So we need pumps, you know, where we need pumps, we need tankers where we need to shuttle water, we have aerials where aer you need aerials, we have tactical units where we need uh, to support the operations. So typically those type of vehicles that you are talking about are way more cost effective to buy. They're not caught you know, in the two year wait to get a truck. Um, they are more efficient to run. Uh, what you need to be able to do is be able to get them to the fire with their, with their equipment, their PPE and their packs uh, and join a complement. Uh, that's already there because clearly they're not going to be showing up with the ability to go two in, two out with only two people. So certainly we need to have conversations with EHS about that. We certainly need to have conversations with our association about that, uh, as well as uh, members of our team. Uh, when I'm talking about our team, I'm talking about our uh, managers who manage the day-to-day -day operations, but it is something that is not off the table, but it really depends on what the conversations with EHS unfold like. Because we don't really feel that makes sense taking two people off a pumper and putting them on a truck and having them ride by themselves because we've defeated what we tried to achieve with the pumper with four people. And I wouldn't want to do that either, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, Councillor Cleary, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just go back to some of the data. Uh, so thank you for providing that, uh, the total cost per thousand pop, because you said it was about 212,000. And so if you look at the MBNN, so when you look at total cost per staffed uh, in-service vehicle hour, uh, there was a huge gap, you know, 295 for MBN, 69 for us, and then it, what, you couldn't do it for the rest of the time period. But the median for MBN, the total cost per thousand pop was around 200 last year or the year before, 193. So we're comparable to Calgary. Calgary is 212,000 per thousand pop. 
but you also said some other stuff in response to my questions around things like, we don't have the kind of staff and vehicles, the apparatus, in each of the urban stations that you might find in other places. Um, and so nothing is really comparable about Halifax with many other places. So, you know, when we're doing this, you know, Councillor Mason talked about, we should take a deeper dive at some uh, point in the near future, especially as the CAO talked about when the uh, regional plan is coming back to us, to really see what fits Halifax. Uh, and, you know, we are getting more uh, uh, denser development in the urban core, high-rise buildings. Now, I will point out, and this was really great, I'm sure you probably have seen this, uh, but I ran across this, there was an academic uh, study that was done at, at a university in British Columbia looking at 13 years of BC data, about 31,000 fires uh, that they looked at. And in fact, high-rises are safer than almost any other structure. And that, you're like, well, wait a second. And in fact, the correlation is the higher the incident happens on, on, in a building, the safer it is. Why? Building code. They have fire alarms that are connected. They have sprinkler systems. They have everything. And if you look at buildings that are uh, alarmed and sprinkled versus others, uh, they're safer too. And so it may not be the structure itself, but the way it's actually constructed under modern building code, all of our new buildings are under the modern building code. They have to have all these things. So I'm less concerned about high-rise buildings because uh, they're inherently safer according to 31,000 fire, uh, fires in British Columbia and the data that they have, and they have taller buildings than we have. Um, but you also said something that was interesting to me when you were talking about the... Um, the, the, the fire safety, the, the POMAX report, and looking at uh, how we were meshing different standards and trying to come up with something that was perfect for Halifax, and maybe it's not. And you actually said, you know, I think we should maybe look at kind of uh, looking at the urban areas differently, looking at the suburban areas and the rural areas differently, because our suburban areas are very suburban. Um, and our rural areas are just like other rural areas. Our urban areas, when you think about the the regional core, the regional center, it's kind of like most urban areas, but we have some legacy infrastructure. So could you just speak a little bit about, you know, more into that about urban, suburban, rural standards for Halifax and what you think we should be looking at, especially if we do take a deeper dive into, you know, different standards or better standards for Halifax. Thank you, through the chair, to your question, Councillor. Uh, I always am intrigued by your thought process and would like to sit down one day and just have a coffee with you. <laughs> In intrigued is an interesting word. So, you know, uh, some of my background, uh, maybe some of you are aware of my paramedic background. In, as a paramedic, you constantly try to evolve uh, with continuous quality improvement, and I'm not saying the fire service doesn't, but I, you know, and one of my core beliefs is to constantly try to do better tomorrow than we do today and challenge the status quo. You know, take pride in our history, learn from our history, but try to do better tomorrow. One of my other backgrounds that you might not know about is I used to be uh, somebody who installed fire protection systems, uh, sprinkler systems. So I'm very uh, familiar with what those fire life safety systems do in, uh, in building footprints. And I would say I agree with you uh, about the building codes and engineering buildings to be safer to a certain respect. So if, if the units themselves have sprinklers, then you are in much better shape than if the hallways only have sprinklers. If you, the challenge with high-rise firefighting is the vertical location of where you need to get your assets. So if you are hoofing up your equipment up stairwells, that burns out firefighters. If you are shuttling your equipment up uh, elevators while people are trying to evacuate the building, you have limited ability to get up there. So when you think about firefighters converging on a on a house fire, they, you know, try to get 14 firefighters there, but the minute they kind of put their parking brakes on and jump out of the trucks, they're at the scene. That's not the case on a high rise fire. The scene is still up 14 or 15 or 16 stories and all your equipment needs to go up there and it's very labor intensive. 
you know, you might recall the fire that happened in, uh, in the UK where, you know, again, a building code issue where they use that flammable product on the outside, but it is also not uncommon to have a content fire where there is no sprinkler in the high rise unit, in the apartment unit itself, and it goes from, you know, kind of story to story to story up the side of the building. So yeah, it depends on the building code, it depends on the, the systems in the building, depends if the systems are maintained, because sometimes they're not, which is why our fire prevention team exists. <clears throat> but I would say that for the most part, if you're in a high-rise building that's built to code, it should be a safer building than, than a house that uh, may in fact burn because it's non-combustible uh, material. However, they're also pushing for uh, wood high-rises nowadays, and when those buildings are under construction <clears throat> and before those fire life safety systems in, they are very at risk. There was just a fire recently down in the States where that happened. So to, to speak to your question about the suburban and rural and urban footprint, there are benefits of our model, but there are challenges of our model. We as one huge organization have a hazmat team that responds everywhere. We don't maintain four or five different hazmat teams. We have specialty programs like water rescue that we're continuing to try to evolve and improve, but we have pockets of responders that can respond because we have so much water in strategically located locations. We have uh, a trench rescue team, not five trench rescue teams. So there are some economies of scale that we bring to the, to the solution for our service delivery model. And quite honestly, probably a lot of volunteer departments would never have some of those services because hazmat is a very specialty operation as is trench rescue. So we have some economies of scale, but where we have a performance metric in the rural area that says if you happen to have career firefighters there, we would expect you to be able to be at this house within a certain amount of time, to me that, the, you know, what we're finding with accreditation, we should just have one standard. If you happen to have career members in that station 24 hours like we have in Sheet Harbor and they can capture a whole bunch of the area in the first in truck time for medical or first in truck for fire, you should be able to get a check mark on that, say, oh no, that standard should have actually dropped to 90 seconds. Uh, we still need the rest of the volunteers for the effective firefighting force because we're only starting with four, obviously. The same applies in the urban core that we need to constantly assess where we have people. The challenge we have is we're one of the oldest cities in Canada. The infrastructure is already in place, not just our infrastructure, but everybody's infrastructure. Our stations are starting, like I said, 25% farther apart than the industry best practice. That means when the next truck comes to the scene, you don't only have their 25% farther, you have your own station's 25% farther. So it me makes hitting the effective firefighting force more difficult than it would be in other communities. So, you know, what is very common in big metropolitan departments is have an urban station with a crew of four to hit the first in truck, and then whether it be the station beside it or the station beside that, to have a station where you have more than one truck, because that would mean you don't need another station to respond along with them. The other thing that I think is important to understand is as we get busier and population will drive more busy, uh, busy department, you may be at one call, whether that's a medical or a car accident or whatever, or a water rescue call with one of your stations, which means now they're not able to respond with the stations around them and now you're going to a farther station to achieve your EFF. That's why you have a 90th percentile, not a 100th percentile, as you could just never hit it. And Lean Six Sigma training tells you the returns on investment to get those last few percent of efficiencies are absolutely huge. You know, council has picked the 90th percentile, you've picked the response time targets we have, you know, 
have we invested in the fire service? There's no argument. Are we trying to make the best use of the assets we have? Yes, the, the service assessment you did, we just re presented that to council the first year I was here. It was not that long ago. So if there's a desire to go back and do another service assessment, we will, but there's not been a lot has changed in kind of the NFPA standards. Um, we have got better data than we had three years ago to help us be able to tell you how well we do. But we continue to try to keep our asks down, which is why our focus this year was based on an imminent need in Middle Musket Abbott and take another year with those 10 firefighters that will come online in June and see how we do with those people in our EFF in the Bedford Sackville area. We just don't want to get too far behind the curve is my point. And I certainly appreciate uh, that, that fulsome answer. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Cleary. Let's break for lunch and resume at 1 p.m.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Budget Committee meeting. Uh, we are still talking about the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency Budget today. Um, and Councillor Mancini, go ahead. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chief, just uh, the last time I spoke, I had asked about uh, firefighters that are off um, uh, and Deputy Chief Meldrum and talked about the numbers. In, uh, and not that I'm going to ask, but I am curious, that, you know, out of the 13 firefighters in long-term disability, you know, what percentage of those are, uh, you, you know, are struggling with their mental health? And again, I'm not asking that number, but uh, that, that's what's curious to me. And, and we've spoken before at these budget uh, meetings, and almost every time that you come to council, well, uh, about mental health. We look at... We all know what the dangers are physically of being a firefighter, right? It's quite evident. Uh, but there are there are the mental dangers, the mental health dangers of of the job of your firefighters, what they see on a day-to-day -day basis. And and the reason I'm asking this now because there is a relationship to budget and I'm trying to understand uh, what is the process when one of your firefighters are uh, in, in need of assistance. Uh, what is the budget line that's available to them? Um, how are we we helping them? You know we lost a firefighter before Christmas time. And that actually, that firefighter chief, I don't know if you knew that, was actually a friend of mine, someone I knew and played ball with and uh, when we were young men and uh, that was tough and uh, we lost a firefighter last year and there were other firefighters that we lost. So can, can you just speak to the, the mental health support to our members? And what I'm trying to get at is, you know, do we have enough support for our members? Because that, that is a byproduct, unfortunately, uh, of the job in many cases. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor, through the chair to you and the rest of Council. I'll ask Deputy Meldrum to speak to your question in detail, um, but as he prepares his thoughts, I would add uh, a couple things. So certainly, anytime we lose anybody, we never did enough, uh, so we'll acknowledge that. I've lost uh, colleagues and friends, not only from mental health challenges, uh, uh, but also other uh, job-related illness like cancer. Uh, we do have supports that some departments do not have, but we are not the highest performing department as far as what we provide. But we also have some unique uh, responsibilities compared to other departments, how we support our members uh, in conjunction with the work that the association does. So I'll let uh, Chief Meldrum explain that. And it is also a challenge where we always have to balance uh, privacy uh, about what the individual is dealing with uh, and whether or not we're even aware of uh, the fact that they may be struggling. So our certainly desire is always to support people when we know they're struggling, um, but I'll let uh, Dave Meldrum talk about those, uh, those supports. Thank you, Chief. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor, thank you for the question. This is a very important question. And I echo uh, the Fire Chief's comments, there's never enough in this field. <clears throat> Having said that, I'll try to very briefly outline the supports that exist right now in Halifax Regional Fire. And it's a complex network of supports based on who we're talking about and what circumstance they're in. So first and foremost, within our department, we administer a full-time firefighter and family assistance program. We have a full-time coordinator for that program and that is managed by our Assistant Chief of Workplace Culture. In that firefighter and assistance program, there are a number of, of elements there, including spiritual leadership, therapy dogs, but most critically, we have a peer support network, so there's always a peer support, actually two, on call every minute of every day of every year without fail. So anyone in Halifax Regional Fire who feels that they are in crisis or distress or simply needs support can reach out to a peer support agent. We will internally within a limited budget of the fire, fire service uh, place a referral for that member needing assistance and get them uh, to professional uh, support and assistance for a you know brief treatment, a series of treatment, which I'll explain what I mean about that in a moment. 
In addition, the FFAP administers our critical incident stress management program. This is very, very important. We know our firefighters are exposed to trauma and injury, highly emotionally charged scenes. So after every such incident, our team is ready and can be called out and is in fact called out at three in the morning in a snowstorm to defuse those firefighters, to remind them of the warning signs, the symptoms, to remind them how to look out for themselves, to remind them how to look out for each other. If a case accelerates or there's a truly you know, large scale event, we can go farther with more formal debriefings and other treatment programs. <clears throat> Now, once the, the FFAP is uh, funded by you, thank you, Council, and it's uh, internal, and it is a relatively small budget line in our, in our overall budget. If the firefighter is a member of the IFF, the IFF administers the on-the-job injury program for all unionized firefighters in our service. So uh, they administer that. To your earlier Council, or not question, but musing, if I may, Councilor, about how many are facing mental wellness supports, uh, we wouldn't have access to that information, and rightfully so. Right. Um, for sure. Uh, in addition to that, and I wasn't asking. I was of just course. Curious, it was just a curiosity overall percentage wise. Of right, course, yeah. and we we work in partnership and collaboration yeah. with the union on all these files. Uh, all of our non-union employees and our volunteers have access to the workers' compensation of Nova Scotia and the on-the-job injury programming that exists there. So for firefighters, again, PTSD is presumptive, and treatment is available. We also fund uh, VFIS, Volunteer Firemen's Insurance Services. Sorry for the gender specific uh, title that is the name of the organization that our volunteer firefighters have access to that programming as well. So it's a network of supports that are available and our coordinator who is a clinician and uh, a, f a manager of clinicians in this field is works very hard to work with each member making sure that they're getting the right support in the right moment and transitioning where necessary from one type of support to the other. I hope that helps. It does. I'll come back. My time is up. So I'll come back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank, thank you, you Councillor Mancini. Um, Chief, would you like to add something to that? Uh, okay, I saw that your mic was on. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I might go back to the conversation around volunteer firefighters and their recruitment strategy, if I could for a moment. And um, it would just, I, I would really encourage that the answer I got earlier was that there are internal strategies and internal documents. And I would say that uh, even as a counselor uh, with a very rural district, if there was a public facing document around a recruitment strategy that I could use as a counselor even to talk about how we help to recruit for volunteer firefighters, I think um, that that outward facing public document on what the recruitment strategy is would be very helpful. And I, I think it'd be helpful to the organization uh, as it on its own, but um, so going to the uh, overs, if I would indulge my colleagues, I would like to bring forward the over option one, which is that, uh, that the budget committee include an increase of 137,100 to increase staffing by 15 firefighters to convert Middle Muscadabit Station 38 to a 24 seven career composite station while maintaining all E platoon stations as outlined in the briefing note uh, briefing note 061 within the proposed 23-24 Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency Budget. Second. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Councillor Daigle Gammon. We have a new list on the screen. So one of the things that you might notion, notice on that motion that I asked for is that not for it to go to the budget adjustment list, but for the decision to be made today as the, um, to include in the budget. Thank you. If that's possible, Mr. Chair. We will work on that. Uh, to list and uh, some decisions can be made here. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor. That's correct. If it's the will of Council that you want to provide direction right now, uh, you can do that. Okay. Thank you. Then I would like the motion to stay. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Um, I'm getting signaled from the clerk that we are just waiting on the wording of the motion and we have it on the screen in front of us. So, 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 so which one is it again? The, oh, I see, okay. Yeah. 
So, uh, Mr. Chair, my, my question for the councillor when she maybe she closes, I, I'm not understanding why she's choosing it now versus adding it to the ballot list. I didn't hear an explanation of, for that. So if you could give us that explanation, that would be appreciative. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just a, a question on this. So, Councillor David Gammon wants to... Um, so by putting 137 on the list this year, we're, we're committing to 1 million next year? By committing the 137 this year, does that automatically commit us to the 1 million next year? Assumedly this is because we'd be hiring them, but we can't hire them until early next year. So it's really a $1 million hit. And uh, Chief, did you talk earlier about there was options to go by five or 10 or 15? Because I'd like to, there's, uh, there's something in the note about that, but I'd like to explore that a little bit more before I make a final vote on that. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Mayor Savage, through the chair to you and the rest of the council. Yes, you are accurate. The briefing note was outlined in increments of five. As stated earlier, we have a ratio. Uh, so while we try to maintain four firefighters in that station, we actually have five assigned there so that we can always maintain four. So if... Um, 15 is difficult. We said if you don't do 15, uh, you could do 10 or you could do 5, which would mean obviously we reassign staff out of less E platoon stations. And the briefing note, uh, I'm looking for it right now, outlines the uh, cost expenditures over the next three years. So, yes. And uh, uh, based on the kind of time constraints earlier, You've seen in our vacancies, we have 11 vacancies right now for firefighters. So those firefighters will start training in August, along with more vacancies that we have between now and then, which means we have no capacity to train these 15 till February, which is why they're only costed at 150,000. But you're correct, next year would be for a full year at third class, fourth class firefighter, and then they, proceed up through the ranks till they're fully costed out in year four. Right, so escalating costs. So what we're voting on here realistically is that by 26, uh, 27, we're looking at um, 1.7 million a year plus. I guess that's the, my preference would be to put this on the ballot and have a, have a chance for us all to do a little bit more work on this, but um, I'll leave that to uh, Councillor Diggleham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Ludlace. Thank you so much. Um, happy International Women's Day. Apologies for not being here earlier, uh, but I did watch on YouTube. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon for putting this on the floor. Um, if you hadn't, I would have. So <laughs> happy to second it. Uh, I think what we're talking about here um, uh, partly is uh, protecting the composite stations that we currently have in those uh, areas that have, that were identified. Uh, Herring Cove, uh, District 11, Chesapeake, uh, District 2, Black Point, um, or Shad Bay, uh, District 13 or District 11. So, you know, the, the reality is that um, to be frank, this process has created an incredible amount of stress to our communities. Uh, you know, the option here, uh, or I guess the conversation around, you know, HRM wants to save money by not, by not hiring firefighters, um, when the reality is it's the firefighters that are there first on scene to address medical calls, to um, care for people in our communities. They are vitally important to the health and wellness of our communities. So I think, you know, by, by having this sort of what I feel like is a cat and mouse game of saying, oh, we're going to take uh, firefighters from this area and we're going to stick them over here because we can't seem to recruit or train enough fast enough um, it is very concerning for me and for our residents because and I and I understand I, I truly do uh, Chief Steubing I understand the difficult situation that you're in with retirements uh, with firefighters that are aging out with injuries uh, with you know people moving away and so on and so forth you lose firefighters you can't get them trained enough and I completely under you can't get them trained fast enough and I completely understand that but on the other hand 
you know, it's sort of like this is deja vu with transit. Oh, we're going to give you this. We're going to give you the service. And then, yeah, sorry, now we're going to take it away. And I just don't think that that is not only sending a good message to our residents, but I don't think that's good business. I don't think that that's good, um, you know, in, in the sense that if we are giving uh, our communities safe security, understanding that they're paying their property taxes to have this service, which that's our job, that's our role, is to provide this service, we should not be taking it away from those communities. Um, so I'm gonna support this because I, I think this is the right direction that the municipality should be going in. And I also know that we need more firefighters. And of course, we need more fire stations. So um, I think all of us in this room need to understand that it costs money to have fire and emergency services. And I, I, I don't think that we can take it for granted. So I would like to see this supported. Um, and, and I think that we need to rethink how we're, how we're overtaxing uh, or over, um, you know, burdening uh, volunteers in the sense that now we're gonna have to rethink how we're running Black Point Station if we're removing, uh, you know, career firefighters or Chad Bay or wherever the decision is made. But I don't know how you would make that decision, Chief, and I'm just wondering, you know, what metrics are you gonna use to decide if this doesn't pass, which one of those is no longer a composite station? Thank you for the question, Councillor, um, through the chair to all of Council. Uh, certainly there is no science on what station to choose. There's no magic formula, but there are a lot of factors uh, that we consider. Certainly the community risk that exists in the community. Is there an old age home? Is there a hospital? Is there an institution that you know would make it difficult for people to self-extricate from a building which would require firefighters to assist with? Uh, industry, uh, we also consider historical call volume. Is it an area that has high call volume versus low call volume? Because if you don't have firefighters, uh, career firefighters in the station doing 50% of the call volume as we do in our E platoon, it's a little less than that actually, but um, the, the calls will fall to the volunteer sector. So you need to have a healthy complement of volunteers in that station to be able to pick up that workload. Uh, certainly, I shared with you, we're looking at technological solutions to be able to offset that. But once we pick the stations that, you know, we would try to kind of address this risk by moving uh, people from a station which we feel has lesser risk, not no risk, right. it's lesser risk, um, then we would monitor that and see if we ended up with, uh, you know, results that we didn't expect. But, you know, it's only good until the next call happens, right? So, exactly. you know, if you pull people out of a station and subsequently there's a call in that station afterwards that doesn't go well, uh, there certainly will be a lot of people asking the question, but it's a difficult decision, and I get it. And I, I can appreciate that, Chief, but the other thing, of course, is we have to look at population growth, and for Hubbards in particular, in Black Point, with Highway 103 there, and the fact that in the regional plan it is an area of growth, uh, there's, there's just no way that I can support any reduction. So I appreciate this uh, motion, and I hope we have support in the room. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I support um, sending this to the BAL. What I'm not sure I can support is sending it uh, directly into the budget. Um, and so my question on that, um, like we're, what, two, three weeks away from that BAL discussion anyway? What does putting it in the budget now versus sending it to the BAL, what is the practical, is there any practical impact? I mean, I, I think I heard the chief say that it would be training in August for this class. Next February. So does three weeks make any difference whatsoever to your planning? If you had approval today or approval for this in after March break when we go over the bow? March 29th. Uh, th thank you for the question um, through the chair to you, Councillor. In reality, no. Uh, other than the message, obviously, to the volunteer sector that Council has heard 
Like I can tell you, we've had communication with our firefighters, both career and volunteer, in the stations being affected. Uh, a, to let them know this is what is in front of council. B, that uh, you know the volunteer sector, we've heard your voice. Uh, we will address that uh, in due course, but the reality is the weeks will not make a difference. Okay, so um, you know when uh, I'll wait to see if the councillor comes back in to explain her rationale. But I would ask, uh, encourage uh, to send it to the bal. Um, you know, just on a point of principle for me. I mean, uh, I think something has to have a very clear, justified reason not to to throw it into the budget immediately. Um, either operational reasons why we should do it immediately, or. You know, that's really kind of what it comes down to yeah. for me. Is is there a good operational reason why something should be built into the budget? Otherwise, I think we the whole purpose of this process that we go through is we gather up everything. There are many other things on that list that you could look at and say, well, those are pretty clear messages to those communities that care about them too. I think we should look at the whole budget in its con in its entirety. And so. Um, uh, if this gets modified, I can support it because um, I certainly think we need the firefighters. I think what uh, Councillor Lovelace described there, uh, you know, it isn't fair to go, you know, pulling from one place to try and fix the uh, fix the problem there and creating new problems in the place that you pulled people from. Um, so uh, I'm supportive of this, but I just don't want to build it into the budget at this time. I want to see it with the whole list. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm supportive of this to a certain extent. I'm just looking for a little more information, Chief, if you could. Um, perhaps I missed it. What is the call volume for Middle Muscadabit? And do you know how many of those are medical calls? And um, I, th I think it's important whatever we come up with is sustainable funding and predictable and, and something that we can continue indefinitely. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you'd explain a little bit more about the difference between the options that were presented in the briefing note. Uh, if, you know, if five, 10, and 15 were presented as options, what are the, what are the differences in terms of what you can do with that, those levels of funding? Thank you. So, Councillor, I don't have the breakdown of medical versus uh, fire calls, but medical would be most. Uh, Middle Musket Obit responded to 67 calls uh, last year, but this resource would not be for Middle Musket Obit. It would be for Middle Musket Obit and the surrounding stations. So I, I don't know if you want me to give you those surrounding stations as well, but your question is uh, 67 for Middle Musket Obit. And the second question you asked, because I was actually looking at this yeah. answer when you no, asked. I was just asking if you could explain a little bit further the differences in terms of the, uh, the uh, work you could do with 5, 10, and 15, because those were all given, those were the options sure. presented to us. What would the differences be in terms of coverage at those levels? So um, the first station for the first five would be Chesacook. So what we would do is redeploy those career firefighters out of Chesacook. And we have to follow our collective agreement and some of it's based on seniority and whether you're a captain or an engineer. But long story short, we would pull the career staffing out of Chesacook, which is 23, uh, station 23. That's a fairly easy uh, decision because we have a healthy complement of volunteers there. And I don't mean easy to do. I mean, when you're looking at that risk option in front of you, that was the first one we went to because we have a healthy complement of volunteers. We have a station beside it in uh, Muscadabit Harbor that we would continue to leave as an e-platoon or daytime staffing model. And, uh, and we would transfer those five firefighters to a 24-hour shift and then apply them to Middle Musket Obit. Then we go to Herring Cove. Uh, Herring Cove is uh, cl relatively close to Station 6 to be able to back it up. Uh, we have had conversations in the past about turning Sheet Harbor 24 hours and you will recall uh, that station was actually in the mix at the same time. They have a decent complement of volunteers and, uh, and uh, a call volume that would have to be picking up uh, to 
taken up by the volunteers. When we get to Shad Bay uh, decision and Black Point, uh, really difficult to balance those priorities. Volunteers are not a lot in Black Point. We've done some uh, recruitment in that area and have made some improvements. A couple of years ago, we were at one or two. We have more than that now and more in the next class. Uh, but they are at the far end end of our response area and in uh, you know an area with high cost homes and uh, and help support the infrastructure in those communities, a shopping center and and whatnot. Shad Bay, uh, another challenge where we have even a smaller number of volunteers. So we're still trying to ascertain whether or not it should be Shad Bay or, or Black Point. And in Black Point, obviously, we would have to rely a lot more on our neighbor, uh, uh, the Hubbard's Fire Department, who we continue to respond with jointly. Um, but this would change those conversations, obviously, significantly. So it is, uh, you know, once council makes their decision, you know, 0, 5, 10, 15, we will put that into our analysis and make, uh, make the best assessment we can and uh, act accordingly. Okay, so the decision for this particular station would affect many other stations? Uh, at least three. Yeah, okay, that's good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Uh, I wonder if we could bring up slide 23 again. That was the uh, fire risk assessment uh, slide. And while that's coming up, so when I look at the options and what each one entails, so if we do five, you're pulling from two E platoons. If we do 10, you're pulling from one. And if we do 15, you don't have to do, you don't have to augment anything. You can just stick the new ones where they need to be. Um, and if we look at that uh, risk assessment map that you talked about earlier and the impact that it has for residents and businesses and our ability to respond, um, what does this map look like? Because right now there's a lot of pink and red, a lot of high and very high risk. What does this map look like if you stick 15 new firefighters out there? What colors would we have? Thank you for the question, Councillor, through the chair to you. Again, you continue to ask questions. I ask myself all the time. So this, just to refresh Council's memory, this map was a proof of concept we developed for community risk modeling based on, in this, you know, at the time, Surrey Fire Department, they were the only one in Canada doing it. Um, We've since lost the ability to do that because the individual has left. But as part of accreditation... We'll, we'll, we'll do this more of a, a thought exercise then. So, so it's a great question. We are currently redeveloping a new tool using sustainable tools. Our ESRI folks uh, in our IT department with GIS uh, analysis are recreating a new version of this. We've, we hoped to have it done by today. Uh, our hope, you know, desire will absolutely be have it done by next year. Uh, we believe that if, if you go to, if, if I could advance the slide deck, we hope to be able to achieve something like this that we achieved in Sheet Harbor. And that's based on the rudimentary assessment we have right now. Uh, this is GIS data and, uh, road time, travel times, about what that station would be able to support for response. So we believe it will turn it less red, if that makes sense, but we don't know what that new tool will look like. Right. But the point is, we're at, we're at high and very high risk at the moment. Correct. And, you know, I can support both what's on the floor. I can also support this going to the bow, uh, but I can support this because when I look at this, and I look at the impacts that this is going to have if we don't put the requisite number of firefighters in, the other communities, to Councillor Lovelace's point, will lose. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know how we can in, in, in good conscience, you know, <laughs> to Councillor Mason's point, you know, we don't wanna have a discussion on um, standards while we're talking budget, because rightfully so, I think the public could look at us and say, 
So you're willing to lower them to save a few bucks? And so I don't want to be in that position. So when I look at this, we have standards. And as you've talked about, maybe we could adjust them and volunteer and, and career should have the same response or a resident should have the same expectation regardless of who's responding to their fire. But when I look at this, if we can just make that red a little pink and if we can make that pink a little yellow, then I, I think we're doing the residents and the businesses out there uh, a, a positive service and we're not making those other areas higher risk by removing uh, assets from them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Go ahead, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, well, really good, I'm so glad I did this. Um, part of the reason, I don't really think that this was gonna change anything operational. You know, Councillor Mancini, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, you said, you know, would it change anything operationally? No, do I think that there is any more information we need. I think that the information we have in front of us now is enough to make a really good decision that we don't have to come back and discuss this and debate it again at a budget adjustment list. Um, I really appreciate Councillor Cleary's comments. You know, we want to change some of that red and pink and we want to change the colors. So I think that that's an important thing. Earlier, I don't know if it was yesterday or the other day, Councillor Oat had said, you know, we're gonna be known as a council that did a lot of really good things that have stretched and been creative in our mandate, um, but maybe not about roads. Well, in the rural communities, I think a lot of this is about what do people think their taxes pay for? Fire, emergency services, and policing. That's what they feel that their tax dollars get them. So the reason I brought this up not to go to the bell is I think that it is something we need to do. I don't, I didn't really think that there is more information that FIRE could give us uh, in a supplementary report that's gonna come at a budget adjustment list. And that's why I uh, didn't do that. And I hearkened to our uh, financial officer's uh, recommendation to say, not everything has to go to the budget adjustment list. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, look, I support this going to the ballot. I have a real problem making that decision today to go forward on it. We have a lot of things on that ballot list. We could have the same argument, Councillor, that you just made. So I, I don't think it's fair to some, some of those other key items that are on that list to make this decision right now. So as much as I support this, going to doing it right now and making that decision, I feel confident. Uh, however, I need to see the entire list and have that debate. Uh, I can't support this if it's the decision is to make it today. I really can't. And that's got no reflection upon what's being asked and what we've heard today. It, it, the conversation has to happen uh, with the other items, to be fair. So it's because there are key items on that list, we can have the exact same argument. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the Councillor for bringing this forward. Uh, Jerry, how many things have we put right on the budget and not gone to the bell? Have we put anything on directly to the budget? Um, Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, the most recent bowel, um update that you would have received yesterday, I think uh, the eight million for paving, I think there was 755,000 for urban forestry uh, as well, uh, and development permit fees, I think they were the three that, that, that we, uh, we moved uh, forward. And I think we may end up looking at that permit fees and adjusting that a little bit from what I'm hearing from the uh, from the community but we haven't done very much I I, uh, I I want to support this too but I have a hard time when we look at all of the other things that we've been looking at you know uh, you know police and uh, and uh, you know, public safety strategies and navigator library and all the things that we've done um, we are in a budget process we asked staff to come in at a certain level, they did, and then they put overs and unders. Those overs and unders are practices that goes to the bow. My preference would be that I don't want council, need, I don't think council needs to be split on this issue. I think we could probably all support it going to the bow from what I'm hearing. And, um, you know, I could very well most likely support it then. Um, I don't want to have to vote against something just because we're contravening a process that we've agreed to follow. So that, that, that's where I am, and I would ask the councillor to consider that. Uh, um, that would be my view on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just, just as a question of procedure, um, 
if if this were voted down to go to you know right into the budget would it still be in order then like not a two-thirds silliness or anything like that for someone to then bring a motion af after to then say well let's put it on the bow right that would be a separate motion because they're doing different things right like you know the one wouldn't preclude the other i would see it as a separate motion okay that's what i wanted to hear uh i'm in the same boat as the mayor Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Othit. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. And, and I think, in theory, I agree with what the Mayor and, and the Deputy Mayor just said, but in reality, not everything on the ballot list is of equal importance. And uh, not of equal importance. So to say the library uh, collection, which is very important, is the same as people in Kathy's district and David's district not having proper fire protection is, is not apples to apples. And be, beware, I'm gonna use the same argument when I come to the people who don't have a fire station in the town we built. But uh, I, I think this is more important than some of those other things. And I think uh, this skipping the ballot list to, st to put a, a, a line in the sand that this is important and perhaps more important than some of the things that are on the ballot list, I actually don't have a problem with. So I think I will support this. Thank you, Councillor Othit. I don't see any further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? question. The question has been called. Thank you, that motion passes. Uh, thank you very much everybody. We are back on the main motion. And go ahead, uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just rejoicing that we all saved ourselves uh, another, another argument from the bell. Um, <laughs> that's great. So, oh my gosh, um, great conversation today about all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I'm, um, I was just going to comment on more and more um, multi-unit buildings um, being built by wood. And even though I know the technology around that has advanced in terms of the wood being more fire resistant and the building codes shifting and sprinkler systems being installed, um, you know, to the point about high rises uh, being more safe, I, I you know, I, I think that we still, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens as we see more high rise construction done and done with wood and, and see how that actually performs in terms of um, fire safety. But um, I also want to talk about um, silos. You know, earlier in this conversation, and I think it was Councillor Mason who said, you know, he was uh, uncomfortable about kind of having this discussion in a silo. And, and, and you know what? I feel like most of our discussions are in silos, actually, <laughs> if truth be told. That's how this, 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 how this process uh, works to some degree. Um, so just back to our response right and being proactive and i know the discussion here right now is about response times is about you know firefighters and fire stations but on the whole are we developing a fire strategy for the city that isn't just based on response to calls but rather how we build a city that is efficient and effective. So back to the sprawl comments that a councilor, a Deputy Mayor Austin made, it was like, oh, like sprawl is a problem. Well, the high rise also is a drain on resources too. So I think we gotta recognize that. But we know that with the, with the subdivision development, we can design them better to increase the response times and to help us meet our targets. If, if we design them with that in mind, whether it's looking at parking, whether it's looking at street layout, whether it's looking at um, you know, distances um, you know, from fire stations and, and starting to shape, shape our cities to be more efficient through the regional planning process. So I just, I, I just wanna emphasize again at the importance I think um, of making sure when we're doing the regional plan and we're doing our planning work that, that this is top of mind so we're not operating in these silos. Um, my other question is about a coordinated emergency response. You know, we just had this discussion about the public safety office and how we have all these different entities responding to public safety. Fire is one of them. Halifax Search and Rescue is another. Um, we talk about emergency health services. So, um, 
you know, in some ways it's like, how, do we have an overarching group or dialogue happening around the future strategy for our emergency, a coordinated emergency response? And how does that interact with things like our public safety office? Thank you for your questions, Councillor. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, our new CAO comes up to speak about some of the question as well around public safety, but certainly we can start it off. We have two reports to through the chair to uh, all of Council. We have two reports that are waking, making their way to Council on the coordination of urban planning and considering uh, certainly fire service uh, capabilities as we develop our streets and communities and infrastructure, make sure water supply exists. So uh, the one is by Councillor Mancini and one is by Councillor Lovelace. So that information will be forthcoming and we are, as shared with you in the past, developing uh, changes to the way we do business and skill sets we have within our own organization to work closer with our planning and development colleagues to do that uh, assessment and planning ahead of time as opposed to trying to clean up on all three afterwards. Uh, as far as a coordinated response, there's kind of two different strategies. What you do when there actually is a call, the emergency response, which is our last line of defense. Uh, what, what, what I've been talking to you about uh, in the past and really breezed over it quickly today is the work that we are doing between calls to reduce uh, community risk and hopefully avoid somebody from hitting crisis. So we are eager to keep moving down that path, it is, uh, is an industry best practice for fire services to use their acceptance in the community. Um, we are not seen as enforcers, we're seen as supporters for public safety and that allows us to build relationships in the community. Um, we uh, still have work to do. We'll continue to bring information back to you on that. That's partly some of the conversations we're having with EHS to go out and hopefully avoid a call from happening in the first place, uh, you know, help people avoid hitting crisis. It's similar to the conversation that happened yesterday with, with uh, the public safety strategy where you swim upstream is the term that we use in the industry to avoid a call from happening and one, when those calls happen, they typically become a lot more resource dependent, whether that's police resources, fire resources, EMS, healthcare, social services, the whole enchilada. So uh, certainly work will happen in the future with the public safety strategy that we are plugged into and wanna be part of, but I'm happy to say we're already walking down that path and wanna be a, a valuable partner. I could add to that the public safety strategy and the changes we're going to make structurally to bring community safety functions together is only going to enhance our ability to have an integrated emergency management response. And right now, you know, under bylaw E100, there is an emergency management planning committee that has representation from all the business units in the organization plus the uh, um, general manager of Halifax Water in the RCMP. That group meets quarterly. Um, my observations is that, you know, we kind of need to get refocused on emergency management. Some of the, for instance, training throughout the uh, pandemic has fallen off a little bit off, off the radar and tabletop exercises and things like that. So I'm hoping that through the um, establishment of the community safety structure, we'll be able to do even better coordination because instead of relying on coordination through a meeting structure in the emergency management planning committee, there'll be a formalized group working on things like that all the time. And you know that uh, in the presentation yesterday, the public safety office contains one component that's really community risk assessment and community risk reduction. They would be working with other business units who have components of that. So for example, fire has fire prevention, fire has risk reduction activities. Um, the property fleet and equipment department 
has environment and climate change responsibilities. So uh, they would be involved in community risk assessment from a climate change perspective and feeding into emergency management from a um, climate risk mitigation perspective, for example, with respect to flooding. So we're looking at the public safety office and the public safety uh, strategy as an opportunity to increase the integration that currently exists. That, that's great to know. I did um, request um, a meeting with Erica, Reflect, uh, Erica Fleck to present something to us at council about this because it, I, I, I think there's a lot more for us to learn about this and perhaps a role for council to play in working with the communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Um, so uh, just two final questions I had. And the one, it might be my own memory playing tricks on me. Um, I seem to recall like when we got at the start of this whole budget process, that giant list of uh, potential cuts, uh, the vast majority of which we have not advanced. Um, one, of the piece, one of the things on the list was the, I, I could have sworn there was an item about call responses to uh, accidents on 100 series highways. And that never showed up in any of the presentations. Um, I'm just wondering, was that something that got pulled away as something that we couldn't do? Like I'm assuming that was going after the province for billing. Not actually billing accident victims on the highway. Thank you for the question, Councillor, through the chair to you and the rest of council. Yes, that was, uh, we got told to explore all part of the possible. We had heard other fire services in the province were in fact billing insurance companies for uh, responses, uh, that was where it started with that kind of concept that we would bill the insurance company. You might not know it, but uh, your insurance actually charges you in your rates for fire response and uh, for motor vehicle collisions, even fire service, uh, for even for fires. So we had tried to chase down this idea of going to uh, the insurance company. What we found out was that was not an option, so then it was, okay, we'll bill the customer and the customer chases their insurance company for the money. But as we explored it further, we actually found out we didn't have the mechanisms to do it and we didn't have the ability to do it based on, I think it was the Halifax Charter. Uh, but certainly we work with our legal team and what we found is it certainly was not cost effective and probably very difficult to achieve anyways. So it's been removed from the options at least until we have more information. Okay, uh, thank you. I just, I wasn't misremembering that. I wasn't imagining it then. Um, the one other question I have, uh, just with the landlord registry and that whole um, thing potentially going forward this year, depending what council decides, um, is there a downstream effort that you folks are thinking about in terms of fire inspections? If we're going into more buildings? Uh, through the chair to you, Councillor, if you give me a few minutes, we'll research that. Uh, I'll connect with our division chief, Matt Covey, um, to ascertain whether or not that would be us or planning and development. I don't know if you recall, we had actually kind of disentangled what their inspectors did versus what we did. We focus now on the fire code, they focus on the building code. So I just need to double check that answer to find out if that registry would drive more inspections Sure, I can, I can get a note offline unless sure. other people are interested too. Uh, that's it for me. Thank we can you. send it to all of council. Super, thank you Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to follow up on my last conversation about supports for mental health, uh, Chief, and maybe uh, the Deputy Chief Meldrum can come forward again. Uh, when, they, when I asked about what those supports are, and he walked me through those, that, that's fantastic. Uh, but he got to the referral, and he said there's a limited budget for referral. Could you share with me, when you say referral, what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, what, what falls under that? Thank you, uh, I'll let uh, Deputy Chief Meldrum field most of that, but I, I do believe there was man money added to our budget in previous years. Maybe you could cover that as well. 
All right, thank you. Through the chair to you, uh, Councillor. Absolutely, yeah, we have a, a limited pool of resources, thanks to Council, which we appreciate, about $100,000 if my memory serves me. What a referral is, so if a, if a member in distress contacts a, a peer agent, those peer agents obviously are trained, they'll handle that. Um, though there's a, a handoff, I hate to use that term, but there's, there's a transfer of this client need issue to the coordinator. The coordinator is, is a trained clinician as well as a manager of clinicians. And uh, they make a referral to, could be a psychologist, could be a psychiatrist, could be another support professional for uh, initial treatment, right? To help in the moment of need, let's make sure that the member gets help. Now obviously with $100,000 a year, when uh, most often, or very often, the client issues are resolved, either temporarily or permanently with that level of support. Um, our coordinator works very hard, if that's not the case, to work with that initial provider and with a network of providers here in the regional municipality to try to move that client to a longer term care plan that's going to have a good prognosis for recovery. And I guess it's the longer term care plan that I'm trying to get to. That's that's can be rather expensive. I'm hearing when I speak to some of your members, you know, it's 20, 30 grand. It's not necessarily always here in HRM. They might have to travel to the states or across the country. Is that is that correct? Is that accurate? Thank you. Uh, yes, it's very, very true, particularly with out-of-province treatment. Um, it's uh, frequently a topic of conversation. Um, I cannot speak for the IFF uh, benefits uh, provider, but I can say that for workers' comp, for example, out-of-province treatment is not funded. And really, it's not typically funded for most agencies or any right. agency that I'm aware of. Right. And, and it's, you know... <laughs> It's challenging because 100 grand is not a lot of money, right? And uh, and uh, you know, and there's a there's a local organization. Uh, I know you guys are familiar with, and the mayor would be, and maybe my colleagues aren't. Uh, uh, called Fight for Life, and they raise those. You've seen the uh, firefighter calendars and such. That's one of their fundraisers, and that's a lot of their funds go to stuff like that. And, uh, my understanding, they depleted their funds in support of our firefighters. So uh, I'm not going to bring this up today, but I think there's a gap here, a serious gap. And I, I I'm working with the CAO on a couple of things, and well, I'm going to come back at a later time. I'm at regional council, and it's not only for firefighters, it's for our police officers and our 911 operators. I just think there's a gap here that we need, to, we should be stepping up to fulfill. Uh, you know, we earlier talked about, you know, Councillor Dale Gagamo's motion being how important it is. Councillor Outhead said, well, mental health is, is the real stuff. And for our first responders, real stuff. And I think we all have an obligation, this council has an obligation that we step up and try to do our best to support that. So I'll be coming back at a regional council meeting at some point in time with this. And thank you for sharing that information, uh, both of you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple things. Follow up from Deputy Mayor um, Councillor Austin's comments about um, building the province for for our services. Um, right now the provinces through the ambulance, they charge ambulance fees for motor vehicle accident victims. $732.95. So, and we don't charge anything. I think that we should really be evaluating, perhaps discussing with the province, a, a coal billing operation or a situation where if, uh, if the fire department shows up in a motor vehicle situation and an ambulance follows suit afterwards to take the, the person away, there should be a cold bill opportunity there. Uh, in regards to health, uh, health uh, medical uh, assist calls, it's the same thing. You know, I think that uh, if, uh, if if we show up first and provide whatever care we can provide, and then the ambulance takes it away afterwards, they're the ones that get in the benefit of our service, and they're the ones that get in the bill, that send out the bill. We should be having some kind of joint uh, arrangement with the province through EHS, whatever the case would be of co-billing uh, that service. So I'd like to see if that could be explored somehow. And furthermore, on sprinklers and stuff, we talk about all the uh, residential buildings and stuff, the high rise and stuff, but I really think that we should be looking at possible programs to encourage sprinklers in, in new home construction. And personally, I think we're to the point that we should have mandatory sprinklers in all new homes in serviceable areas. And uh, I know it'll be at a cost to the house, but in the long run, it should save them insurance money as well as I think we should also perhaps have a grant program or, or a tax reduction service where they can probably get apply for a grant reduction against the fire protection rate on their home because they got sprinkler systems in their house. Uh, so I think that's something we should probably reevaluate this whole sprinkler bylaw for residential buildings. Um, I think it's uh, long overdue.
Thank you for, I think that was a question uh, through the chair to council. Uh, certainly I've made some notes and we'll have some conversations on uh, as we explore the options with EHS on co-billing and cost services uh, that's going on provincially. So I can, I, I don't have an answer for you on that today, but certainly can keep it top of mind as we have our conversations. On the sprinkler bylaw, you're preaching to the choir here uh, as a former sprinkler installer. Uh, this is something that has been a heavy lift across Canada. They've tried to get it into the National Building Code for decades and have been unsuccessful. Some communities have looked at uh, individual bylaws. So if there's a will and pleasure by council for us to do that, we can certainly do that work uh, with the legal team to see if that's uh, a possibility for consideration, particularly in our rural areas. But uh, so one of the challenges with the rural areas is the water supply. So, you know, the sprinklers only work if there's water in the system. So the systems are a lot more costly in a rural area because you typically need a reservoir of water for and constant power supply to uh, monitor the system. But uh, if, if there's a will and pleasure, certainly we can look at that uh, with the legal team. I was advocating in the serviceable boundary areas where we do have centralized water where water pressure should not be a problem. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councillor Hensby, and thank you very much, uh, Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency and, and uh, Chief Steubing for all of the information that you have uh, provided for us today. Uh, there are no further speakers on the list, and the question has been called. So, Ian, it's over to you. Thank you, and that motion passes. Thank you very much, everybody. The next item on the agenda is adjournment. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Mason. We stand adjourned. We will see you as the Budget Committee on March 29th to evaluate the uh, BAL adjustment list. Thank you.